Take our Bibles and let's turn to Jeremiah 8 before we really get going this morning. Before we stop and pray, go to Jeremiah the 8th chapter. And I wish I could say that everything that we talk about always is going to be rosy and pinky and nice and lovely. But that's not true. And when the messengers of God always speak in such smooth terms, you can be sure that they're not a true messenger of God. One of the reasons why Jeremiah was disliked was because Jeremiah spoke the truth whether people liked it or not. Is that true? One of the reasons why he was thrown into a pit. And can you imagine being thrown in a pit with dung's waist up to your chin and still having the character of God? Not getting upset at your persecutors. That's, that's nasty. Can you imagine being sown asunder like Isaiah? He was sown in half, put into a hollow log and cut in half. But by the grace of God, he stayed faithful. All the men of God who spoke truth eventually were persecuted. And it's coming again. If we're going to stand for truth and preach the truth, we're going to be persecuted. And it's not going to start at the Sunday law. Persecution starts prior to that. It doesn't always start uh, in such uh, open ways. Sometimes you'll be persecuted subtly. People stop talking to you like they used to talk to you. People stop inviting you to their houses. People start running from you when they see you coming. They want to get, <laughs> get away from you. This type of persecution was happening to Jesus. But Jesus loved his father too much than to turn his back on God. I, I want to have that type of an experience with Jesus. Well, I don't care what anyone says. If God said it, that's enough. I love him. I want to be with him. That's the experience that God wants. In fact, in Jeremiah 8, speaking of this, he brings us out. Jeremiah, the eighth chapter. We want to pick up in verse 11. Let's read that together. Jeremiah uh, chapter 8 and verse 11. Are you there? Amen. amen. Let's read that together. What does it say in verse 11? It says, For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. Now, what did he mean, Jeremiah? They have healed my, uh, the daughter of my people slightly. You're going to find out he means it was a fake healing. It wasn't real. It was surface healing. It's like somebody making a, a, a messing up your car and then putting a, a paint on top of an epoxy, making you think it's better. But it's still messed up beneath it. He said, you have healed the daughter of my people slightly, saying, now how do you do it? What, 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 they, what were they doing? Saying what? Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Now, do you imagine right now somebody says, well, I don't like the message of God. It's too uh, urgent. It's, it's a dooms message. I want to hear more rosy, flowery messages. Well, God says, I can only tell you how things really are. If there's a storm outside, you know what I have to tell you? There's a storm. If everything was good, then we can say everything is good. Will there be a time when all is good? Yes, yes or no? There will be. Is that time right now? No. What we're approaching right now is not a time of peace. Go to Jeremiah 14. That was Jeremiah 8. Now go to Jeremiah 14. This is why they hated Jeremiah so much. His own people, his own countrymen. Jeremiah 14. But I, it may be for Jeremiah, but that would never happen in the Seventh Adventist Church, would it? Never in the Seventh Adventist Church would you be hated for being a Seventh Adventist. Never. I mean, Jeremiah must have been a Philistine, right? No. He was among his own people. Jeremiah 14, verse 19. Let's read that together. What does it say in verse 19? It says... Are you there? Yes. Let's read that. What did it say? Hast thou what? Utterly. Utterly rejected Judah. Have thy soul loath Zion. Why hast thou smitten us? And there is no what? Healing for us. We look for. Now why were they looking for peace? Because that's what the false teachers were teaching. They said, oh, Babylon is not coming down. There's going to be no time of trouble. We're not going to be scattered and taken from Jerusalem. Our temple will stand forever. No one will ever attack us. God will never allow us to go into the hands of evil. But God said, there's no peace now. He said, you look for peace and there is no good. And for the time of healing. And behold, not healing, but what? It wasn't a time of peace. It was a time of trouble. What's coming upon the world? A time of trouble. Are we getting ready for this? This is our goal. This is our objective, and so we need to understand it. Do we see indications that a time of trouble is going in the world, yes or no? Look at what this says here. This says, the U.S. has officially, what's that next word? Unflat curve with its worst day of the coronavirus pandemic yet. 
You know that right now, the people are making it appear as if we're out of the crisis. One of the vice president and the president was asked about it, and they said, oh, the pandemic, that crisis is over. Now, how can you have a worse condition and you say it's over? You have to think we're fools, or either you don't know that we think, well, you understand. It says, on April the 7th, less than a month after reported cases of COVID-19 begin to rise, what? Dramatically in the United States, the rate of a new infection has reached a peak, an average of 31, 000, over 31,000 new cases per day, meaning close to 10 in every 100,000 Americans were testing what? Positive. But it says until now. The latest data shows on Tuesday that the U.S. surpassed the high water mark at more than 31,700 infections per day. The state of the pandemic in this country is officially worse than it has ever been. So when everything shut down, the condition today is worse than it was then. Why did they shut down then and we're so uh, 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 desirous to open up right now? Why now? What, what, what do you think? Money. Money. They said, look, if we don't reopen, our economy is going to be in. And, and it has been said, let's not make the cure better than the uh, uh, problem, the virus itself. But we're going to find out it's not getting any better. On the tail of this, here's New York Post. Uh, po a post says, Pope Francis says what? Coronavirus could be nature's response to climate change. So we see the coronavirus here. And then it's getting worse than ever before. And then the Pope stands up and says, this, I believe, is a response, a reaction, a result of us not properly dealing with what? Climate change. Now, what is that telling us? What, what, what is being linked together based on this? What is being linked? Climate change. And what else? And, the corona, and COVID-19 or the coronavirus. We know that's a disease. We could call it a pestilence. So we see this being linked together. Now, question, did the prophets say that it will ever be linked together like this? Now, do you, do you, have, do you have your books that we, we, we told you to bring every class? You have these great controversies? You don't have your... Sister Minnie! All right. Well, we, we, can, we can forgive you for that. That's right. We, 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 have, we, we have an extra one for you. <laughs> <laughs> leave it in your pew. That's right. You leave it here because we don't want you carrying all that on your on your bag. We understand. All right. Thank you. We'll come to a page in that in just a moment. Right, that, that was it. I think more. I praise him. He's a, the smoke is always prepared. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> yes. Praise God, Sister Minnie. Praise the Lord. We've got to be working like this. Very good. All right, we'll come to that, we'll come to that in just a moment. I'll tell you the page in just a moment. But this, we're going to find out the prophet is, has told us that, that the world would link this together. And there is a link. There's a literal link between these two. Now, they don't understand the link, but there's a link. Now, this says, recent fires and floods... As one of nature's what? Responses to the world's amb ambivalence to climate change. Now, ambivalence, what he's talking about is uh, where you don't do anything. You, f you, you don't feel like anything's there. Like, you, 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 it's no problem. Uh, there's no such thing. So, how has people looked at climate change? What, have, what, what the mo many in the world have said about climate change? It's a what? Hoax. It's not real. And as a result, what have they done to try to address it? Nothing. It says, there's an expression in Spanish. God always forgives... We forgive sometimes, but nature never forgives, the Pope said in an interview. He said, look, God may forgive you, but the climate is not going to forgive you. We reap what we sow. You know, that's the law of nature. The law of nature is if you sow a tomato seed, you're going to get an orange tree. You, if that happened, you'll say something's wrong with, with, with nature. Nature has gone mad. If you sow a, a tomato seed, you're going to get what? A tomato plant. If you sow an apple seed, you're going to get an apple tree. You're not going to get but what the seed. In other words, keep what you sow. That's a law of nature. So if I am disrespecting nature in the environment, what from nature? Disrespect and destruction. And so when you destroy nature, you are setting nature up to destroy you. And so there's a law of nature. 
the Pope said when responding. Then note and watch what he says. Pope Francis said that the world had yet to respond to recent partial catastrophes related to the climate. Who now speaks of the fires in Australia. He said, who's talking about the fires in Australia now? It burned up so much of Australia. Or who remembers the 18 months ago when a boat could cross the North Pole because the glaciers had melted? Now, uh, years ago, a boat crossing the North Pole never happened because there are too many glaciers. But boats could cross it. Then we saw, happy birthday. <laughs> We're talking about this glaciers before they couldn't even cross the North Pole because of the glaciers. But this is telling us that when the, when, the, when the heating up of the planet started, it started making this happen. Who speaks now of the what? Floods. I don't know if these are the revenge of nature, but they are certainly nature's responses. The Pope went on to say he believed that COVID-19 outbreak that has ravaged the globe could inspire what? So he's saying, if we don't do anything, it's going to get worse, that we're in a time now that there has to be a what? Talk to me. So he's linked climate change with the COVID-19 that has gotten the worst it's ever been. And he says this should induce us that there might, that there should be a what? What does he want to change? Now, God wants to change, but everything God has, Satan has a counterfeit. Now, watch what he says. The Pope went on to change. This is the time to take decisive step to move from using and misusing nature to con contemplating it. With more than 1.5 million coronavirus cases reported across the world, the Pope says that the virus has shined a spotlight on what? Hypocrisy. As large outbreaks continue in the United States and parts of Europe. This crisis, what do you call it? Crisis. crisis. Is affecting us all, rich and poor, free and bond. That sounds like the mark of the beast. You will find. This crisis is affecting all of us, rich and poor alike, and putting a spotlight on hypocrisy, he said. He's saying that we need a change. In this crisis, that there's a change. Now, how many ever read any of his encyclical that he put out in 2015 that was dealing with climate change that presented to the United Nations, presented to America, the President of America at that time accepted it, the, the United Nations accepted it, 196 countries accepted it. Do you, anybody, anybody see anything of that encyclical that was put out? You show a few of it, all right? Now, do you know inside, because he said, Notice we say, he said, oh, if you want to know what to change, he said, mi by misusing nature, that we, instead of misusing nature, we must what? Contemplate. What does contemplate mean? Study. Think about it. Study it. Think about it. Consider it. So now, he said that the solution, if you just consider nature, you'll see the solution to nature. Now, in the encyclical, he tells you what that really means. Now, here, it's just suggested, but in the encyclical, he tells you what it means. He started talking about rhythms. Do you know he was going through rhythms of seven? And he started going through. He recorded Leviticus 23. Uh, and then he was going through rhythms of seven. Seven day, he talked about the seven day Sabbath. He called it the Jewish Sabbath. Then he went through all these rhythms of seven. And he said, in nature, everywhere, there's rhythms. Then he said, but God has a new rhythm. And he said, on the first day of the week, God created the world. So if he's going to recreate the world from its death-like state, what we need to honor in order to do that. Do you see the satanic wisdom of this man? He's saying that if you want the earth to start healing, it's going to be more than cut off your cars. It's going to be more than stop the emissions. He said that you have to watch the rhythm and learn to respect healing. If God started the creation on Sunday, then he's going to recreate it by us honoring Sunday. And do you know that the entire world embraced that encyclical and never knew what they read? You know, he, he was telling us there's going to come a crisis. And guess really what he is telling us the solution of that crisis is? Sunday. Is a crisis coming, yes or no? Yes. Now we're going to find out. The next article said from June 1st, 2020. All the pieces coming together. Is the United States on the brink of another civil war? Yes. What does brink mean? On the edge. So now, now we've been showing you something about this long before this happened. This is 2020. Now watch what he says. Last August, I forewarned in byline times that the actions and the rhetoric of U.S. President Donald Trump were likely to transform a domestic terrorism crisis into a violent right wing insurgency. But things have spiraled disastrously out of control in the 10 months since then. 
Over 100,000 Americans now is over what? Over 120,000 have died, over 2 million, 2.5 million cases. Uh, at the same time, a record number of businesses have filed for what? Bankruptcy. And cities, municipalities, and states collapse under crushing debt and failing tax revenues. What you're looking at is the conditions that led to the French Revolution. What you're looking at is the conditions that led to the American Civil War. It says pouring gasoline on the woes is a president who has proven to be unfit to lead and unable to put the interests of desperate sick nation before the interests of himself. In other words, he puts himself before everyone else. Do you know that right now that some of his strongest supporters are beginning to turn? People that have voted for him and thought that he can do nothing but good are now causing their turn. Now, should they be upset at the man? Should we be upset at people, yes or no? no? No. But we should understand what's happening. Mr. Trump himself doesn't fully understand what's going on. We should be praying for the president. Just like Daniel prayed for Nebuchadnezzar. We should be praying for the president. We should be praying, Lord, open up his eyes. Lord, help him to be converted. Nebuchadnezzar was converted. Why can't he be converted to God? And so we must do that. But we must never let the deception of a man trick us. We cannot let loyalty to men stop us from understanding what is true. It says, anger towards Trump's recklessness, specifically in sitting on his hands for nearly four months as the coronavirus spread throughout the country, has been simmering beneath the surface for what? Weeks. One lady, she said she was upset. She was a movie star. She said, a so-called movie star. She said that uh, she was upset now. She was a Trump supporter. Her father was a heavy Trump supporter. Her father was over 70 years old. He had been watching one of the news stations. I won't say which one. But she had been watching one of the news stations and he had read or heard on there that it don't worry about the coronavirus. Even if you age, it doesn't really mean too much for you. It's you, you are right. It's a hoax, et cetera, et cetera. And so when his daughter told him about it, he says, it's just a hoax. I'm not worried about this. She said, no, we just did his eulogy. And she says, I blame it on that news station and I blame it on you, president, who I used to support. How could my father have believed you? And now the man is what? Dead. Do you know that it's a wrong, it's a, it's a strange thing to put your faith in a man. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Death. Now, we see it's on the brink. Another article says, this model forecasts the U.S. current unrest a decade ago. It now says what's coming? Civil War. Now watch this. In the early 1990s, who was the president? Bill Clinton. Was in the White House. And the United States looked how? Remember, we studied this in coming events. In 1990, America became the world's sole remaining what? Superpower. Who could touch her? Nobody. That's what it appeared like. That was the, the heyday. The administration appointed Jack Goldstone. Ah, I meant to put up a slide. I forgot to put it. Jack Goldstone. Anybody know who Jack Goldstone is? Jack Goldstone is a, a famous Harvard professor. Supposed to be some intellectual man. Uh, he, is inter he is intelligent. He doesn't know the message, but he's intelligent. He knows history. He's a political scientist, a sociologist. It says, to, but this man was commissioned at that time during the 1990s to see how states what? Fail. You know what it means by fail? Collapse. Collapse. They meant other states. In other words, not America. He was just supposed to study the world and see how states fail so he can have a model uh, and understand how to improve. Not the U.S. Few expected that his model would later predict their, their own country's what? So the same thing, he studied this model, this famous sociologist, historian, uh, 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 professor. He studied all the histories of revolution. He's a master in revolution. That's his specialty uh, in, 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 in studies. And he studied through all the models. He put one together and then saw that what he put together is what is the major model to cause collapse and revolution. He says, we're doing it right now in the United States of, in the 1990s. Guess what he said in the 1990s it might erupt by? Let's continue. It says, in an unpublished paper sub submitted for peer review, Professor Goldstein, who is a sociologist, that's those who study society, uh, an expert on the mathematical modeling of historical societies. When you say an mathematical modeling, anybody knows when you say mathematical, what are you talking about? Numbers. Time. So mathematical modeling of history means that you study ancient histories, and you see how long it took for them to happen. And then you can apply that to present and future models. 
So in other words, he could look back and say, oh, I took the, the French Revolution a couple hundred years, and then a revolution started. Or in, 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 in Russia, it took a few hundred years, and then all of a sudden it started. And then now applying that principle, saying, so in America, based on that, when America starts doing this, this, and this, America will happen to this long before a revolution starts. Are you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's a mathematical, historical model. Are you following me? Yeah. All right. Now watch what it says. It says... This condition is a mathematical model of historical societies have concluded that the U.S. is headed for another what? Civil war. The conditions of civil violence, they say, are the worst since the 19th century, in particular the years leading up to the start of the American Civil War in 1861. So he modeled history and said, if you look at America right now, we look almost identical to what was happening in America just before the Civil War. The reasons for this are trends that began in what year? So the 1980s begin all those trends that led everything up with regard to inequality, selfish elites and the polarization that have crippled the ability of the U.S. government to mount an effective response to the pandemic disease. This has also hampered our ability to deliver an inclusive economic relief policy. So this, if we only had some relief, it could help us. But they see no relief. Watch what it says. The, is the U.S. headed for another civil war? And one word. What's the answer? Yes. Watch what the man says. It almost would put hair on your head if you, if, if, if you didn't have any. It says, Professor Goldstein is a leading what? Authority on the study of, what does the prophet say is coming? Revolution. What is another word she said is coming? Civil war. It says, in long-term social change at George Mason University, the model developed by him and another gentleman tracks data. What do you mean by data? Ideas just thrown together? Information. They track that as the ratio of median workers' wa uh, wages, et cetera. They went through several things. Applied it to U.S. what? History. It predicts the 1861 Civil War and the unrest of the 1930s. In other words, if you take their model and you look at the mathematical precision and the numbers, it actually predicted what would have happened in 1861 before 1861. The same thing in the 1930s when you saw the Great Depression. It says 10 years ago, Professor pointed his model towards the... In other words model and looked at the past and saw everything lined up without any numbers just like he said now he said I'm going to put it toward what now watch what happens he pointed to and made uh, 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 it towards the future and made an uncannily accurate prediction just like in the 1850s crisis indicators were rising he wrote in the journal of nature they could be a reliable indicator of looming instability and look to set to peak in the years around 2020 this is history. I told you every field of knowledge, the sociologists, the political scientists, the historian, the economists, the religions, everything is telling us that 2020 is the beginning of the. Yeah. And so if you look at this, this is his model. I don't have time to go through the model right now, but you look at the model. He showed all of it going back from 1780s, showing the exact same point. And he said that 2020 will be the time. Has it happened? Yes or no? coming events we see are just like what? A jigsaw puzzle. Can you see the pieces coming together, yes or no? We can actually look at the pieces. And if we know the picture, we can watch the sanctuary and begin to start saying, this is what's going to happen next. This is what's going on. We see what the picture is. We know that before the whole thing is 7,000 years, but not on earth. How much on earth? 6,000. So then as we approach 6,000, what should we see developing on the earth? A time of peace. What should we see developing as we approach 6,000? A time of trouble. Now, what happens just prior to the time of trouble? What happens just prior to the time of trouble? This means starvation to the poor classes and in a... Then what's next? There will be a time of such as never was. So first civil war in the nation, then worldwide revolution, and then we see a time of trouble such as never was. Daniel 12 verse 1. So we can see the pieces of the puzzle. If we know it, we can then say, if I see a civil war developing, then what does it tell me as it relates to 6,000? We have to almost be at 6,000 for there to be a civil war in America and a worldwide revolution. We have to be almost there. So what we have to do today is get that back to the Bible and find out how close are we? Are you following? But we're not just interested in how close. We're not just interested in the time. We're interested in what can be accomplished. There's a word in a. 
Now, we didn't finish that study. Great work in a little time. But my emphasis today, as the Lord put upon my heart, as I was mentioning, I said, Lord, what should we do? And the Lord said to me, you must emphasize this. Uh, let me write here. What does that say? How much is at stake? Now, if a man was doing something, five dollars is what he's gambling. How much is he afraid of losing when he has ten thousand dollars in his pocket? Are you afraid of five five dollars? He puts down ten dollars. He afraid, but all of a sudden now the stakes are high. He puts in nine thousand uh, nine hundred dollars. Is he weird about this? That man before, he may have been sitting relaxed. Well, he's, he got everything in there. You can see him. He, he's sitting up now. He's looking at his cards. He's he trying to look at your cards. <laughs> he, wants to, he don't want to lose this one. Why? Because there's too much at stake. Do you know why right now that we can sleep at seven at Venice? Why we can come to church or not come to church? Why we can play or not play? Why we can read the Bible or not read the Bible? Why we can study or not study? Why we can try to give victory to sin or not give victory to sin? Why we can continue carelessly? You know why? It's because you know what? If we did, when the devil came with a temptation, do this. The God said, don't do. Eat this. God said, don't eat. Do this. Think this. Then we would say, I cannot afford. It's too much at stake. This is what kept Jesus awake in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is why his disciples, you know what they did? They weren't awake. You know what his disciples, I'm not talking about the Pharisees. I'm talking about the disciples of Jesus. They were what? Sleeping. And inspiration says, and that sleeping uh, disciples represents a sleeping church. When to be found asleep is most perilous. If ever there was a time to sleep, it's not 2020. From this date forward, it's going to get worse and worse and worse until the sun laws pass. And so what God has said, beginning, we've got to wake up and listen. Do you know it doesn't matter how many people? Do you know that if, if there was just three people in this church, two people in this church, one person in this church, God would do it with one. God is not interested in numbers. He doesn't care about it. He cares about souls. He cares about quality, not just the quantity. And so right now, God's not looking at, oh, we have a little church. You know that right now God can use this church, just this church, to reach the entire world. I'm not talking about Richland. I'm talking about the world. Seven billion people plus. You know, in this church, over 12 people right now. Do you know that that means that there was 12 men that reached the world? Then what do you think could happen if just we got serious here? What do you think could happen to Virginia? The entire state could be transformed. We can then reach from this state to another state. And they say, who is doing that? They must have an army. No. Or just a little team who came together as a family to understand Christ and his work and his plan and are now working in harmony with Jesus. And do you know that there's going to be a great work accomplished in a little time? I want to be among that team. What do you say? So we've got to understand. Now, we're still studying identity crisis in the final generation. We're still studying great work in a little time. But one of the great emphasis that I want us to be in our mind is, how much is what? When that sunny loss pass, we're going to find out that the come on the scene. Are we on the brink of the civil war? Yes or no? Yes. Do you think we need to get ready? Yes. Esther had forever to get ready, didn't she? No. How long did Esther have? The, the day of the decree. Three things she had to do before that decree. And we're told, remember now, don't forget this statement. In volume 5, 450, it says church and state are now making preparations for the future conflict. Protestants are working in disguise to bring what? What do we see? The climate change and the Pope and all this. What is it bringing? Sunday. This is what's going on, but it's in disguise. It says Protestants are working in disguise to bring Sunday to the front, as did the Romanists. The, what's the next word? Decree, which is to go forth against the people of God. Talk about the National Sunday Law will be not similar, but what? Very similar to that issued by Hasserarius against the Jews in the time of Esther. So if you want to know the crisis in the last days, you've got to look at the crisis of Esther. What brought the crisis in Esther's day? We're going to find out it was the day of the decree. What's going to bring the crisis in our day? The day of the decree. So that's the limit. Was there a limit in Esther's day? Yes or no? What was the limit? The day of the... Now, this is so important. We're going to find out that all the Bible is really trying to unfold something about the plan of redemption, which means there must be another day and another decree of the plan of redemption that is the limit for the people of God. Now, before that, 
there were three things Esther had to do to save her own people and bless the world. I'm reviewing. What was the first thing? She, come on, Brother Smokey. He didn't even blink his eye. Excuse me. He didn't even blink his eye. The first thing we had to do is what? Realize and recognize our distinctive identity. In other words, we've got to know who we are as a people. Do you know that when we're finished with this, I want you to be happy that you're a Seventh-day Adventist. I want you to be happy and understand that Seventh-day Adventism is not just any other religion. That Seventh-day Adventism is the religion of the Bible. That you can stand flat-footed. Somebody says, oh, you're a Seventh-day Adventist before? You might run and hide somewhere. All your neighbors, they, they, they're Baptists and Pentecostal and Methodists. And you, oh, where are you? Uh, I, I, I'm a uh, We're going to church on Sunday. When y'all going to church? Well, we're going to church too. Sabbath. Saturday. We don't have to be high. So that's that symptom, the ugly duckling. She didn't know how beautiful she was. When we understand our identity, we don't have to be prideful. But we will have confidence. This is the message. We will take our stand with the people of God. So much so that others in other denominations will look and they will say, you have the message. Where does that way? And they're going to run to the church like I showed you last week. Teach us thy way. And we're going to show them Jesus. We're going to show them the plan of redemption. We're going to show them thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. They're going to come in here and see this message. And they're going to say, I want to be a seven Adventist. Amen. But how can we give it if we don't know it? If we don't have it? And so what God has to do for us is to make us seven Adventists. Someone said, well, I was already seven Adventists. You know, I, 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 you know, now you might get ready to start throwing me out like Jeremiah. <laughs> we are seven Adventists in name, but we're not really seven Adventists yet. The Revelation 3 says you have a name that you live and are dead. All of us right now, we have a name of seven Adventists, but we haven't really seen seven Adventism. What we have to do is go into that sanctuary, and when we get in there, we're going to look and say, that is Seventh-day Adventism? Yes. That's what's necessary in order to finish the work? Yes. Then we say, speak, Lord, for thy servant here. Amen. Well, that means I have to sacrifice this and sacrifice that. We say, oh, well, well if I have to make that sacrifice, I guess I'll just leave God. And, 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 and. Is that what you're going to say? We say, by God's grace, you can have the world, but give me Jesus. Amen. So we've got to get into this message. We've got to understand it because the reality is, guess what? We're not ready. Do you want to get ready? Yes. Let's stop right here and let's pray as we go deeper into this study. Asking for God to do something for us miraculous. Heavenly Father, we are in trouble right now. But you are the solution to our trouble. You are the solution to our problems. And if we can learn to see Jesus in that most holy place... If we can learn to understand your message and enter into this relationship with Jesus and your true way of living, you can so change us, radically change us, that we can be ready by your grace. And then you can use us to fit and help others. Help us to learn to realize and recognize our distinctive identity, to embrace that distinctive identity, and then to manifest in our daily life that distinctive identity so that when we say it with our lips, we're not hypocrites that we will be what we teach. Father, please help us today to understand how much is at stake. I'm a weak man, but Lord, we need to feel the conviction of how deep this thing really is. And I am incapable, Lord, without your Holy Spirit. Please send down your Holy Spirit from heaven that we may understand how much is at stake, that truly there's a great work and a little time. Teach us what this means today, dear God. Abide with us now, we pray, and we thank you. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, I was praying to God all this week. As I was working, I was working, but I was praying. I'm cutting the grass, but I'm praying. I'm working on the field, but I'm praying. Working in the office, but I'm praying. A uh, counseling person, but I'm praying. I'm saying, dear God, and I'm thinking about everybody, praise the Lord. But right here, we're in this local church. This is our family church. And I was saying, dear God, Help us understand. Because see, as we finished the little message last week, I said, Lord, I can tell we didn't fully get it. We didn't fully get what was really at stake. And so the Holy Spirit said, take your time through it. Our time was getting away, so I'm kind of rushing through the end. But I want us to understand today. So by God's grace, we're going to take our time through this. Do you want to take our time? Yeah. We've got to understand it. Because when we understand it, then we're going to actually literally see, dear God, 
This great work I cannot do unless I have Jesus. I've got to have an experience of Jesus. And then it's going to move us from being calm and complacent to having a spirit of urgency. Now watch what the Bible says. We're going to Revelation 12. Now in Revelation 12, what we're going to see is that the great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward now in 2020 for nearly 6,000 years. How much? Nearly. Not 6,000 years, but nearly 6,000 years. That great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward now for nearly 6,000 years is about to end. And Satan knows this, and so his attack on us is greater on this generation than on any other generation. And he knows that there's only one church that has a message that could give an understanding to this. What is that name of that church that has the message? Seven Evans. So we're going to find out that the devil has done something to try to attack us from understanding the message that he's given us. Now, look at Revelation 12, because as the devil sees this time is short, his eternal existence, the devil's eternal existence is at stake, and so he's doing everything to try to stop God's plan from being finished. Look at Revelation 12. Revelation 12, let's pick up in verse 12. Revelation 12, let's all read this together. Revelation 12 and verse 12. Are we there, amen? Yes. Now, we're going to look at this verse several times. We're going to stay in Revelation for a little while, back and forth to understand something. But let's look at verse 12. And let's read that together. It says, therefore, what's the next word? Rejoice. rejoice where? Yeah. Now, we're going to notice that two places are mentioned. It said, rejoice ye what? Yeah. So the first place it mentioned is what? Yeah. It says, now, what did it say to heaven? You can now do what? Rejoice. What does rejoice mean? Sad or happy? happy? Be happy. So something must have happened for God to say uh, that the heaven should rejoice. Something must have happened. We need to find out what happened. But let's continue. It says, rejoice uh, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, in them. Where's the in them? In what? Heaven. But then it says, woe to the inhabitants, inhabitants of the earth. Question. What's the second place that it mentioned? Talk to me. Earth. So it says, heaven you can rejoice, but earth you can't rejoice. So there's something different in heaven than what happened on the earth, and we need to find out what it is. Now it says, Rejoice ye heavens, and ye to dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. Now what has happened? For the devil. devil is come down unto you. So what was it that made heaven now rejoice? Because the devil was what? Cast out of heaven. And when the devil was cast out of heaven, heaven could what? Rejoice. But then it says, woe to the earth. How come the earth couldn't rejoice? Because while he was cast out of heaven, he now moved his base from heaven to earth. So what became the battlefield now of the great controversy? Earth. So now we see that earth is the battlefield. And because of that, there has to be a woe. Now let's follow. Now it says, having great wrath because... Now, why is the devil so upset when he comes to the earth in Revelation 12, 12? Why is he upset? Because he knoweth that he have but what? So Satan now, as he comes to the earth, he recognizes that when he gets to earth, what is the thing that is agitating the devil the most? And what about time? So what does that tell us? If Satan guesses his time is short, that what the Bible says? What does it say? Satan what? So then that means that Satan understands the time span that he has on the earth. He knows that he has a lot of time. Didn't we study this, yes or no? We found that he had a lot of time, this limit, and Satan sees as the time is getting shorter, it's making him work not slower, it's making him work how? Faster. It's making him work not lighter, it's making him work how? Heavier. He's throwing everything he has as the more time, I don't have a little bit of time left, he's going more, 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 because he understands how much is at his eternal existence. He knows this. And so the devil now is coming with great power. And when we look at this, do you think that we are a match for the devil by ourselves? I don't care how much we pray or study. By ourselves, we are no match for the devil. He's much smarter than we are. In fact, Interation says, watch what the prophet says. Let's read this together. Early Writings 119. It says, I saw that the, talk to me. Remnant. Now remnant, not talking about seven Adventists. Not the world, seven Adventists. The remnant were what? Not prepared for what is coming upon the earth. Is something coming? It says, stupidity like lethargy seemed to hang upon the minds of most of those who profess to believe that we're having not the first message, but the what? Yeah. So this last message in Revelation, the final generation message, God has given it to us, but most of us are ignorant of this message. And it says, my accompanying angel cried out with how much? 
Now, what does that mean? That there's entertainment going on. We're just laughing and joking. Is that what it says? Uh -uh. They were looking and how much is at stake? And so the answer is what? Get ready, get ready, get ready. Why? For the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. His wrath is to be poured out unmixed with mercy. And ye are not what? Ready. Now, my question this morning is, why are we not ready? Is that a good question? Yes. I'm going to tell you why. By God's grace. The reason why we're not ready is because we don't know how much is at stake. This is one of the great reasons. In fact, one of the great reasons we are not ready is because we don't understand that the war is still going on. The war is what? Do you know that the average person has been made to believe that the war ended 2,000 years ago? You know when they think the war ended? Talk to me, somebody. Anybody, anybody know in the, in the majority of the world? In 31 AD at the cross, Jesus cried, it is finished. And someone says, whoosh, praise God. We were serious at first, but now the war is over. We can relax. We can take out our straw and we can chew on that straw with torn overalls. That is, that is the country song used to say. So this is what they said. That this is what we can do. But listen now. Did the war end at the cross? No, 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 no. Satan has been successful in getting the majority of the world. And sad to say, even many seven at Venice, he's been successful in conver about 99% of us. He's been successful in making us believe that it all ended here, and as a result, we've given up the war. But I'm going to tell you something. The cross did not end the war. In fact, the cross was not the end. Guess what? The cross was only the beginning of that real great controversy. It had been talked about, but that was the real beginning of that battle. Anybody know what that is right there? How many have ever heard of halftime? <laughs> tell me what you normally think about when you're at halftime. Talk to me. Football. Football. Now, I want to ask you a question. In football, four quarters. Halftime comes at the end of the second quarter. Am I right? What if somebody didn't know about football? You ever met people who didn't know about football? <laughs> you, they may have heard of it. They don't know how the game is played. They just look and what, don't know what's going on. But people who like football it, and understood what it's about, when the halftime show comes, let's say a man uh, and the halftime comes up. Man, uh, one team is up by seven. And the man didn't know about football, so he's, he's oh, I'm trying to go for that team that's up. And so he goes, yeah, they're up uh, by seven. And then halftime comes, and the whistle blows. Half stops, and he says, Shoo, that was a good game. All right, let's go home. What would you say if you knew about football? It's not over yet. That same team that was up, guess what? They can lose. Is it possible, yes or no? Yes. See, we don't think that that's true with Jesus. It's in our minds, we feel that because of the cross, that it's impossible for Satan to win. But I want to show you today, by the grace of God, that's not true. And there's only one seven, there's only the one group of people that know this. And this is why the devil hates us. We're going to find out that by the grace of God, we're going to find out as we study. It's possible for Satan still to be in the game. And he can win this by what is called. You know what that is? You know what TKO means? Technical knockout. Do you understand that a person can lose something technic technically? In other words, they may be a better team, stronger team, faster team, but if they don't uh, come in harmony with the technicalities of the game, they can what? Lose, even though they're a better game. Am I right or wrong? Have you seen games like that? Where the person, they made the shot, they, they, they scored the touchdown, but somehow their foot was on the line. And the referee called it up, out of the line. They made the shot right after the buzzer goes off, and so the count, even though they made it, it doesn't what? Count. Now it went in. They had the skill, the ability, the strength, the power, but they lost on a technicality. I want you to understand, the devil can't beat Jesus with muscle. He understands the plan of redemption by studying it, and Satan understands there can be a technical foul. And the, guess what? The only thing that shows us what the technicality is, the sanctuary. Thy way, O oh God, is in the So what we're going to do is jump into the sanctuary and find out the technicality that Satan understands. And then the win that Jesus made on the cross, Satan could turn it into a defeat if that technicality is not reached. We need to find out what it is. Does that, does that mean that God is not skillful? Yes or no? But guess what? You want to find out any time there's a technicality involved, it's going to be because humanity is also involved. When Jesus himself is the only one playing, he never misses. But on a team, you always have teammates. And on, you know, the, if an, on an opposing team, you know what the defender knows, whether it's basketball or football, they know the, the man who is the best player on the team. 
And they say, if we only have a few seconds left, put everybody on the best man, because if it gets into the hand of a man that's not as skillful, we still have a chance. And we're going to find out that the technicality he knows is that the last person running in this game is not Jesus. Guess who the last person running in this game? His teammate. And guess who it is? And Satan says, I may not have got him when Jesus was there, but I can get him when humanity must complete this game. We're going to understand this better as we study. I pray that we have the ability to make this plain because we've got to understand how much is at what? Now, the reason why many people are not ready and are not even trying to get ready is because if you think it's already over, what, what are you getting ready for? If church is over and you wake up and you see that it's two o'clock, are you rushing to come to church? You say, what? I missed it. It's what? It's over. So if we think that the plan of redemption, the great controversy is over at the cross, what are we getting ready for? Nothing. And so what is the reason why we're not ready is because Satan has made us somewhere in our mind not understand this. But we're going to find out that the cross, if you go into the sanctuary, if you go into the sanctuary, the cross is only half time. How do I know? The plan of redemption is divided up into two parts. First, the work that happens in the outer court. And second, the work that happens in the sanctuary. The work that happens in the outer court represents that which happens on earth. The work that happens in the sanctuary represents that which happens in. That's the two places of Revelation 12. When Jesus said it is finished, where was he? Talk to me. So what had happened? His work on earth was what? Did he finish his work in heaven? That meant that, that when Jesus went back to the cross and the, on the first fruits, later on we'll study that. At the first fruits, there was a halftime celebration show. We're going to show you that the, the first fruits offering was a celebration. Jesus went back to heaven and all of heaven, when they saw him, they said, who is this Lord of glory? Who is this Lord of glory? There's fanfare. There was cheerleading. Everybody jumping up and down. And he waves them all back and says, I want to be sure that you will accept my people before we can celebrate. We're going to show you this. God cares about us. Now, when we go here, he finishes the work on earth. But now that tells me then that the cross, that was not the end. That was only what? That was, that was halftime. That means that Satan then still has some more of the game and he still has a chance to do what? Come back and win the game. My teacher who taught me, who's now resting in the grave, he used to like football before he understood better the work of God. And he used to like the Baltimore coach. He used to tell me this story all the time. He would tell it. And the Baltimore coach had a famous uh, a quarterback named Johnny Unitas. Uh, do you know Johnny Unitas? <laughs> I would have never known if it wasn't for my, uh, for, for my teacher. And then I looked him up, looked at the research, understood him. And then you'll find out, John Unitas, there was, it's called the greatest football game ever played. In the last few seconds of the game, they had been down the entire game. In the last few seconds of the game, they did all these special plays that brought them from the end of the game as losers, and they won the game in less than, uh, in less than two minutes. Two minutes left on the clock, they won the game. Do you know what happened? Most of the people had already left the stadium because they were, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're playing a game and, you, you know you gotta, and you're in a losing team and everybody starts joking on you, so you leave before the game's over. you got a few seconds left, you leave so that you can get out before all the other teams, ha, you lost! And, and sometimes people had gotten into fights and stuff like that at the end of the game. So the, most of the stadium emptied out, and guess what? They missed the, what, what would have been called one of the greatest games because they thought it was over. So what you and I have to do himself think he's going to nail this in the coffin. But I praise God, God's going to upset the devil in the final moments of earth's history. So we better sit in our seats. We better not go nowhere. We better not leave the seven church and go home. We better stay here and understand this message because we're going to see something if we're there. Can you imagine a few fans who say, you know what, I'm going to stick it out with my team. Even if we lose, I'm going to stick it out. And their mouth dropped open as they watched the last few seconds and said, what? We won! They, they surprised themselves. They turned around at the opposing team. We won. We won. And they stole the champion. Do you know this is what's going to happen to us? Amen. That's going to produce a loud cry. So what? In the Bible. And try to understand this for ourselves. Are you ready to study? Okay. Revelation 12. Let's see first that the war is not over. Go back to verse 7. Revelation 12, verse 7. When did the war start? Go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. What did it say in verse 7? Verse 7 says, and there was... War in heaven. That's that first place before halftime. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought his angels. Michael represents who? Jesus. 
Verse 8 says, And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived how much of the world? The whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were what? So we can see that the heaven could now rejoice because the devil was what? Cast out. And let's follow this now. And so we talked about halftime. It says, the intercession of Christ and man's, what's that next word? Be half. <laughs> In the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. Now, do you understand that sentence? This is great controversy 49. I want to make sure you understand that sentence. If we, if we don't understand that sentence, we'll never know how much is at stake. Let me read it again, then I'll ask you what it means. We're not going nowhere until we can understand this. It says, the intercession, one, of Christ and man's behalf, where, where? So his work in the heavenly sanctuary, above, in heaven, is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. What does essential mean? What is essential? Is as essential. What does as essential mean? Essential means significant. As essential means what? Equal. Now, so that sentence is telling me. Tell me. Talk to me, somebody. So what this is telling me is, I'm going to come back here. What this is telling me is, number one, there's a work in the sanctuary. That's in heaven. There's a work on earth. So we have heaven and we have earth. Then we found out that this is saying that his work in heaven is equal to his work on earth. So if he does not finish his work in heaven, his work on earth meant what? Nothing. So if we say that his death on the cross ended everything, it shows us we don't understand the value of his work where? Where? So the work was started on earth, but the work will be finished where? Mm -hmm. So do you see then if the devil could stop his work in heaven, it would stop the plan of redemption, which is necessary to have both of these works as a part of the one plan. Do we understand? Yes. All right. Let's go a little further. Interesting tells us God could have destroyed Satan. This is Isaiah 87, 59. God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth. How hard would it be to take a pebble and throw it to the earth? Not, Not hard. hard. Easy. It says that's what God could have did to say. So it's not a matter of the devil defeating God because he's stronger. He can never do that. When they match power, what did God do to them? Hurl them out of heaven. Jesus said, I saw Satan <laughs> fall from heaven like lightning. Why are you rejoicing that the demons are subject to you? Jesus said, they were, the disciples bragging, yes, the, the devils were subject to my name. And God said, what are you rejoicing about? You don't understand, not the devils. I saw Satan himself, the prince, the king of devils, Dump down from heaven like lightning. That's nothing. The real issue is, is our name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm -hmm. Do we have a relationship with God? That's what Jesus was trying to bring out. Because we can do many wonderful works mm -hmm. and still hear Jesus say, I never knew you. you. In fact, one of the twelve who did one of these wonderful works, casting out devils, was lost. What was his name? Judas. It says, God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth. But he did not do this. Why not? Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. So the plan of redemption can't be won by force. Mm -mm. This great war, the great controversy for nearly 6,000 years, it cannot be won by force. Mm -hmm. If it was forced, God would put it down a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It's more than that. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under what? Satan. Who's the only one that tries to win with force? Satan. That's why persecution. It says, the Lord's principles are not in this order. His authority rests upon his goodness, his mercy, and his love. And the presentation of these principles are the means to be used. God's government is what? Moral. Moral. And truth. All you have to be is arm of truth. Mm -hmm. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. truth. It says, and truth and love are to be the prevailing power. Mm -hmm. That is what God wants. He could, have, uh, he could have done that. God, we read that. It says, it was God's purpose to place things on the eternal basis of security, and in the councils of heaven, it was decided that what? Time. Time must be given for what? Satan. Satan. So God did not overcome Satan by force. What he said needed to be given to Satan was what? Time. Now, you and I, if we weren't studying the sanctuary, I would just leave it at that. But because we've been studying it, thy will, guys, in the sanctuary, you know now. 
How much time did heaven come up with to give Satan to work on earth? How much time? 6,000 6, years. So time, 6,000 years at this point, was given to Satan to develop the principles which were the foundation of his system of government. He had claimed that these were superior to what? God's principles. Time was given for the working of Satan's principles that the heavenly, uh, that, that, that they might be seen by the heavenly universe. In other words, if Satan says his way is better and God says his way is better, he says, I'm going to give you time and time will tell. tell. Whose government is better? Whose law is better? Whose way is better? Mm -hmm. Satan led men into sin and the plan of, talk to me somebody, redemption, redemption was put in operation. How long? For 4,000 4, years. years, Christ was working for man's uplifting and Satan for his ruin and what else? Degradation. And the heavenly universe, behold it all, it says how long for what? 4,000 years. Now how much time was left over? 2,000. Now watch this now. And this is talking about when Christ came on the earth. Now, why did it say 4,000? When did, when did God kick Satan out of heaven? Way back before the earth started, right? Right. right. So then why in the world is it saying that, for, that, that there was 4,000 years before Christ came on the scene? Why was it saying this now? You've got to understand something. There was war in heaven. We read that in Revelation 12. Satan was cast out. Am I right? Yes. Well, you want to find out that after something happened, Satan had access to go back to heaven. Something happened on earth. They gave Satan access to get back into heaven, and we're going to find out this has something to do with the 4,000. Does anybody know what happened? Anybody know what happened? The Bible, go to 2 Peter. We'll come back to Revelation 12. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2, and we'll come back to Revelation 12. Now, this is when the Bible gets deep. you got to go line upon line, priest upon precept, here a little, and yeah. there a little. got to let the Bible explain itself, but watch what happens. 2 Peter chapter 2. And we want to pick up now in verse 19. Uh, Amaya, would you read that for us, please? 2 Peter 2 and verse 19. What does the Bible say? While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man... Wait a minute now. For whom a man is... Overcome. overcome. Of the same is he brought in bondage. So if a man can be what? Overcome. overcome then he's brought into what? Bondage. Bondage. Then everything that that man had, guess what happens? It's gone to the person. It becomes, it becomes transferred to the man who brought him in bondage. For example, if a man, if an if a, if a army is fighting, and then the army has guns and tanks, and all of a sudden one team defeats that army in battle, there's booty or there's uh, spoils of war, right? Right. All of those things become what? The, the winner winning. who overcame the battle. Are you following what I'm saying? Right. All right. So now watch now. Satan is kicked out of heaven. And Satan is at the tree. Eventually in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, you find out Satan is now confined to the tree of knowledge of what? Good, Good and, and evil. evil. And Satan, studying the technicality, finds out that if I can overcome who? Adam. Adam. Particularly Adam. Why not? Why, why Adam? He's the ruler of this world. What did the Bible say in Genesis? God declared even from the beginning. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Go to Genesis, the first chapter. Look at Genesis chapter 1. And we want to pick up in verse 26. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. What does the Bible say in verse 26? You know the text. Verse 26 says, And God said what? Let us make man how? In our image after our likeness. And let them have what? Dominion. So God created man. Who was the first person he created? Adam. Adam. So who got dominion first? Adam. So who had the first dominion? Who had the first dominion? Adam. Adam. So then, what, what do you mean by dominion? What do you mean by dominion? Rulership. rulership. Good. Control or rulership. So Adam was the king of what? Earth. Earth. Of America. Earth. Earth. That's the entire world. Am I right? Yes. So he was given dominance on the entire world. That's Genesis chapter 1. So now, if Satan could overcome Adam, what would Satan get in spoil? The, the earth. earth. So then the Satan earth. would become what? The king or ruler of this earth because he stole it from Adam. Here's two oh. boxers fighting. One has the heavyweight champion of the world. Here's a man who's never been in boxing before. He just comes in first month of boxing. This man had the title for five uh, years. Man comes in, knocks him out. TKO, technical knockout. What happens to the, to the belt? 
Eight it transfers months. to that man. He's only been a boxer for a month, and he has the heavyweight champion of the world. Yes or no? Yes. Because to whom a man is overcome, he takes all. Winner takes all. Oh. So when Satan, he recognized, if I can defeat Adam, I can take dominance over what? The whole world. And I will be the ruler of the world. Now, I'm going to tell you something. He wasn't going to stop it. That was just his first game plan. Question, was he successful? Yes. Yes, he was. When Adam, and see, he got Eve first. He went through the weaker vessel. Separated them always before something falls, there's always division. So he divided Adam and Eve up first, and then that was precursor to the collapse of the first government, a division of the home. And so then, once that took place, Satan got Adam, and when Eve, they were working through Eve, got Adam and partaking the fruit, then sin into the world and death by sin by Adam. And so that was the situation. And how long did Satan maintain this dominance? Because go to Job. Go to Job chapter 1. Let me show you something. Go to Job chapter 1. Now Job is after creation. Of course, as you know. Let's go to Job chapter 1. And then you will notice something very interesting. I want to ask you a question about it when we read Job chapter 1. And we know that all of this is trying to help us to understand the plan of redemption. Man, the Bible is good. Isn't the Bible oh, good? Yes. Look at Job chapter 1. Look at Job chapter 1. Let's look at verse 1. Let's look at verse 1. Job 1, verse 1. Let's read it together. There was one a man. a man in the land of us whose name was Job. Job. And that man was, here's our word, that man was what? Perfect. And upright. One that feared God and eschewed evil, hated evil. Verse 2. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Verse 3. Uh, says he had all this substance. Look at the last line of verse 3. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. east. Now let's jump down to verse 6. Now there was, let's read the next two words, there was what? A day, a day when the sons, sons of God, God came to present themselves, themselves before the Lord. Lord. Watch, anybody know these sons of God? Anybody know these sons of God? The rulers of every world. Remember, God had other worlds. Job speaks of the other worlds. And, 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 and he got all these worlds and intelligent beings on there, and there were rulers of every one of those worlds, just like Adam was the ruler there. There were rulers of, of all those worlds. Now, they all came together at a general conference. They, had, well, they were having a universal planning session. A general conference meeting for the entire world. And as they came up, guess what happens now? The sons of God are there. And what, you remember Adam, if you go back to his lineage, Adam was called the son of God. He was one of those. But then notice what happens now. In verse uh, 9, it's, uh, verse 8, it says, And the Lord, no, back to the verse 7. 6. No, no, back in verse 6. We just finished verse 6. <laughs> now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and what's the next word? Satan, Satan came also where? Among what them. is Satan doing up in heaven among the sons of God? What is he doing there? Representing, Representing the earth. earth. Next verse. Next verse. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? What was he saying? What are you doing, what are you doing here? here? Then he says, from going to and fro, let's look at the next three words. Where? In, in the, the earth. earth. Not heaven, but in the what? Earth. So it came from earth, now up in heaven, because it says, that's where I came from. That's where I was. And then, you know what he was saying. Let's continue to read. And from walking up and down in it. So what was Satan really saying? Let's read between the lines. What's really going on here? God says to Satan, what are you doing up here? Because, he, you know, Satan, can you imagine? He comes up to heaven. All the sons of God are there in a little vestibule uh, in, in front of heaven, as it were. And all the sons of God meet there, and Satan strolls in. Can you imagine Satan's chest out? Mm. And he's walking around. Well, dare somebody say something to him. He wants a man to say, what you doing here? He wants to so he can brag why he's there. So he's just looking around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, God steps up and says, what are you doing and Satan says, for well, I came from earth. In other words, I have a right to be a because aren't all the rulers of this universe right here? Mm -hmm. Well, I deserve to be here. Now, question, how did Satan get that right? Because he was cast out in Revelation 12, that war in heaven. Mm -hmm. How did Satan get the right to be among that group that were meeting there? Talk to him somebody. He took the rulership of the earth. He took the rulership of the earth by overcoming Adam and leading Adam into sin. And so he says, this earth is mine. That's how I became the God of this world, Corinthians says. And that's why later on that, that, that Satan said to Jesus, if you will bow down and what? Worship me. I will give you this world. 
So this is what his plan was. He said, I deserve to be here. But God said, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Look at the next verse. The Bible says in, 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 in verse uh, 8, And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou what? Consider. He said, Before you start bragging and thinking the earth is yours, don't you know that I still have somebody on that earth? Yes. I can contend your technicality. Do you know that in order to, to, to maintain control of the earth, it had to be somebody who was a human being. Mm -hmm. The angel couldn't do it. It had to be someone who was nearest of kin. It had to be somebody who was in humanity. It had to be someone like that. And so God says, wait a minute, look at Job. Job is not fully under your control. That shows you that you don't have complete dominance of the earth. It's not yours. And you know that Job was just an example to remind him of who was really going to come. Mm -hmm. Who was really going to come? Jesus. So what Jesus was doing was, don't you remember? You were in the garden. Don't you remember Genesis 3.15? Mm -hmm. I told you I'm going to come. And I'm not going to come like God. I'm going to come like a man. Because I have to be in that same flesh in order to control the earth. He said, I'm going to come just like a man, like Adam did. In fact, that's why Jesus is called the what? Second Adam. Mm -hmm. Go to Micah. Go to Micah chapter 4. Go to Micah chapter 4. This is what the Bible is about. Go to Micah chapter 4. You want to see that Satan then, at this time, after he was kicked out of heaven the first time, at the tree, when he got Adam and Eve to sin, he took control of the earth, and for 4,000 years, he held, as it were, the earth and the title, the heavenly title of the earth, he held it uncontested. Mm. Was it going to remain that way forever? It's a long holding. Was it going to remain that way forever, yes or no? No. no. That's why the Bible says, or Israel says, Satan lay man to sin, and the plan of Israel sitting in operation for how long? 4,000 4, years. years. Now you understand why they said it, because we're going to find out something happened in 4,000 years. We'll pick it up. Notice what the Bible says. Where I tell you go? Micah. 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 Let's look at that. Micah chapter 4. We're going to Micah chapter 4, and we want to look at what the Bible says in verse 8. Micah 4 and verse 8. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? And thou, O tower of the flock, the, flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, until thee, what's going to happen? Shall it come? What's going to come? Even, even the, the first, first dominion. dominion. So who was given the first dominion? Adam. Who stole that first dominion? Satan. Satan. But the God, the Bible was telling us that God is going to give His people, Zion, His people, back the second dominion, the, the first dominion. So He's going to give them back the first dominion. Now, how would He do that? How would He give them back the first dominion? Jesus. Through Jesus coming in what? Adam's, Adam's uh, 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 and, and coming as a man, picking up where Adam fell. That's exactly right. The second Adam. Could he do this as God, or did he have to be in the incarnation? Incarnation. So God had to become man and win this battle as a man. Do you understand? Yes. But do you know that when Satan heard that God was coming as a man, he told the angels, we're winning. Because his whole purpose was to take God off of the throne, throne of the universe. And so when God, yeah. Jesus, got off the throne and came incarnate, guess what he said to his angels? Look, we took him off the throne. Who has been successful as us to take him off the throne? Now watch it now, watch it. Man, this is so serious. You've got to understand how much is at stake, brothers and sisters. Patriots and Prophets 41. It says God permitted what? Satan to carry forward his work until the spirit of disaffection ripened into active, what's the next word? Revolt. So what is the last stage always of Satan's government? Revolution. What is the last stage of the Satan's government? Revolution. Revolt. Give me another name for revolt. Revolution. Revolution. So when we see the earth approaching revolution, that means that Satan's government is reaching its end. Mm. Because every time Satan's government is demonstrated, revolution is always the result. Overturning of law always the result. And so this is what Satan did in heaven. This is what he's doing on the earth. earth. It's the same war. It's not over. It says it was necessary for his plans to be fully what? Developed. That's why time was given. That their true nature and tendency might be seen by how much? Oh. Lucifer as the anointed cherub. Does the Bible speak of this? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Isaiah 14. Had been highly exalted. He was greatly loved by the heavenly beings. And his influence over them was what? Strong. So we don't understand how strong Lucifer was in heaven. He had everything that the angels did. Lucifer was the one who commanded them. So they had an affection toward Lucifer. It says God's government included how much? Not, Not only, only the inhabitants of heaven, but of what? All, All the worlds. The worlds that he had what? Yeah, he created. Those were those sons of God in Job chapter 1. Mm -hmm. And Satan, guess what he wanted to do? 
And Lucifer had concluded that if he could carry the angels. angels. Now this is what Satan said. He flattered himself. That if he could carry the angels of heaven with him in rebellion or give me another name. Revolution. revolution. He could carry also how much? All, All the worlds. worlds. Because the angels were higher in intelligence and power than these other worlds. Mm -hmm. Did he deceive the angels yes or no? He did. How much of the angels did he deceive? A, A third. third. Does the Bible say so? Yes. yes. Do you know my next question? <laughs> What's my next question in Bible Training Institute, BTI? What's my next question? Where? Where is that in the Bible? See, everything that prophet says, it's in the Bible. And that's seven and minutes, we need to know it's in the Bible so that we can defend what God says and give an answer to every man that asks of us, the reason for the hope that's within us with meekness and fear. How do we know that Satan was accepted? You're going to find out that Satan actually had deceived nearly half of the angels, but some of them came back. And he was only successful in taking a third out of heaven. Now let's go to the Bible. Revelation chapter 12. Let's go to Revelation 12. Did so I told you we'll go back and forth to Revelation. It, it, is the picture beginning to form, yes or no? Yes. yes. Good. Let's go to Revelation 12. Verse 4. Revelation 12. Good. We're going to start verse 3, though, but that's, that's the point. That's the point. So go back to Revelation 12, verse 3, and we're going to see the answer in verse 4. Go to Revelation 12, verse 3. Let's start in verse 3. Let's read that together. What does it say? Back, Sister Davis, would you read verse 3? Revelation 12 mm -hmm. and verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon. All right, now is this literal language or symbolic language? Symbolic. How do we know who the dragon symbolizes? We read it earlier. How do we know? Satan. Well, how nine. do we know that? Verse 9. Verse 9 shows us that the dragon is a symbol. Verse 9 says, if you read it, verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the yeah. devil and Satan. So the dragon represented the devil, and he was the same as the serpent in the garden of Eden. So in Revelation 12, verse 3, when it says, And there appeared another one in heaven, and behold, a great dragon, the Bible is saying, This is a symbol of something that Satan did. Mm -hmm. Let's see what he did. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. All those symbols, we're not time to go through right now. Uh, verse 4. And what's the next verse say? And what? And his Who's tail. tail. Whose tail? Whose tail? Satan. Satan's tail or the dragon's tail, Satan's tail, drew how much? The third uh, part. The third part. Part of the stars of, of the heaven. stars of heaven. Mm. Literal language, symbolic language. Symbolic. So we see a symbolic dragon, and that symbolic dragon represents who? Talk to me. Satan. Did I make it up? Was that in the Bible? Bible. Bible. Verse 9. Then it said that the dragon had a tail, and his tail drew how much of the stars of heaven? A third. A third of the stars in heaven. We know the dragon is Satan. What are the stars? What do the stars represent? We know that symbolic angel, language. Because angel. Satan can't literally take uh, 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 the literal angels out of heaven. This is symbolic language. Anytime that you read in the Bible something that can't literally happen, you know it's a symbol. Now, what in the what does angels represent? Uh, uh, stars represent in the Bible? <laughs> angels. Go to Revelation chapter 1. Let's go to Revelation 1. Go to Revelation chapter 1. And we want to read verse 20. Brother Jimmy, if you'll read this for us, please, with that strong voice. Revelation chapter 1. And verse 20. What does the Bible say in verse 20? This is the first <clears throat> chapter of Revelation, chapter 1. We're trying to find out what do stars represent. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Well, stop right there. The seven stars are the what? Angels. So a star represents a what? Angel. So when the Bible says that the dragon, representing the Satan, with his tail drew a third part of the stars, he's talking about he drew out of heaven how much? A third, a third of what? The angels. Of angels in heaven. Is that Bible, yes or no? Amen. Now, it says his tail. That's not a literal tail. The devil doesn't have a tail and his fork. That's symbolic language. What does the tail represent? Lies. Isaiah chapter 9. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah. Good, good. Isaiah chapter 9. Always thinking, always thinking. That's important. You've got to be thinking first so that it can exercise our mind. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. And those who the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9, in symbolic language, will understand what these, this tale represents. Isaiah chapter 9. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. Amen. Good. I see Brother Smokey is there. He's not playing. In fact, we'll let Brother Smokey read this. Isaiah chapter 9, if you read for us, my brother, verse 15. What does Isaiah 9, verse 15 tell us? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 15. Now, what are we trying to find out? Dragon represents who? 
Satan. Satan. The stars represent who? Angels. Angels. But what does the tail of, the, of Satan represent? What is it talking about? Isaiah 9, verse 15. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet <coughs> that teaches the lies, he is the tail. So when a leader teaches a lie, they become not the head, but the what? Tail. So then what the Bible is telling us is that Satan drew a third of the angels out of heaven by teaching lies. lies. That's what they symbolize. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, do we make this up or is the Bible explaining itself? The Bible. This is the great converse. And as a result of teaching lies, the third was swept out of heaven with deception, and now they were cast to this earth. But Satan overtook Adam. And as a result, he now regained control of this earth, and that became his battleground. And he says, if I can take a third angel with me, is it possible that he could take the other unfallen worlds? Mm -hmm. And if he did so, he would have then took control, not just of earth, but of what? Uni the universe. entire universe. Mm. I'm talking about how much is at, at stake. stake. Now watch this. Says. God's government included not only the inhabitants of heaven, but of how much? All the worlds that he had created and Lucifer had concluded that if he could carry the angels of heaven, did he carry them? Yes. With him in rebellion, he could also carry, carry also how much of the worlds? All the worlds. This is what he's at. The entire universe. He offered presented his side of the question employing sophistry and fraud to secure his objects. His power to what? Deceit. That was his tale. Lies. The teaching lies, deceit, deception. His power to deceive was very great. By disguising himself in a cloak of falsehood, he had gained advantage. All his acts were so clothed with mystery that it was difficult to disclose to the angels the true nature of his what? Work. Until fully developed, it could not be made to appear the evil thing that it was. Now, if you were to study the story of Absalom, I don't have time to go through it now, but if you were to study the story of Absalom, it was a picture of this. Absalom. Uh, he was David's son. Mm -hmm. And he took offense to some things that happened. He, he got uh, upset. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, he wanted to do something to overthrow the kingdom. He wanted to take the throne from the rightful king. And in so doing, the son of the king, the one that was created by him, the son of the king, who was highest next, next into man to take rulership, that son began to stay at the government. In the king's place, you can read the second Samuel, and he began to tell people when they came up to him and said, "Have you been treated right? If I was the king, I would treat you differently." And he talks to all the different people that come to the king this way. And the Bible says he stole their hearts. And so, when the rebellion took place, almost the entire kingdom was on the side of Absalom. This was a picture of the great controversy in the plan of redemption. Every verse is to unfold this. And so as we see that, we can begin to understand Satan believed he was going to be successful. And had not God intervened in David's behalf, Absalom would have took over the government. Am I right or wrong? Oh, yes. I'm going to tell you something. If it were not for the power that Jesus wanted to display through you and me in the last days, Satan would take control, mm -hmm. not just of this little earth, but he would take control of the entire what? What universe. universe. It says, until fully developed, it couldn't see what it was. Even the loyal angels could not fully discern his character or see what his work was what? Leading. They didn't understand this. Watch what Satan said in the picture on the prophet 66. When Satan heard the enmity that exists between himself and the woman, and between his seed and what? Her seed. Where was that? Genesis what? 315. He knew that his work of depraving human nature would be interrupted. That by some means, Man would be unable to do what? Resist, Resist his power. power. Yet, as the plan of salvation was more fully unfolded through the century and through the Bible, Satan rejoiced with his angels that having caused what? Man's fall. fall. He could bring down the Son of God from what? He's exalted. He says, look, we're, we got Adam. We bring Jesus down from the throne. And guess what? When he comes to this earth, we're going to defeat him. He says he could bring down the Son of God from his own position. Let's read this together. He, he declared, declared that what? His, his plans had thus far been what? Successful. Upon where? He said, look, we lost in heaven. Only the angels did. But not man. And so now he says, but on earth, we've been successful. We regained access back to heaven. He's walking up and down in heaven. And he says, and when Christ should take upon himself what? Human nature. human nature. He also might be what? Overcome. Just what I did to the first Adam. Guess what? 
I'm going to do to the second Adam. And guess what? We will have control of the universe. Mm. Then when Christ is taken into the human nature, he also might overcome. And thus the redemption of the fallen race might be what? Prevented. But guess what? If he can do the same thing, not only to his work on earth, but to his work where? In heaven. In the heavenly sanctuary, the same thing would happen because it's just as important to the plan of redemption as was his death upon the cross. Are you following me? Yes. All right. We found out it was God's purpose to put things on the eternal basis of security. We read that. Time was given. How long? For 4,000 years. And then Christ came on the scene. The accuser. Who is the accuser of our brother? Satan. Satan. Who is Satan? See? That's weird. See? Revelation 12, let's, let's turn to it. Go to Revelation 12. Does the Bible call him the accuser of the brethren? Yes or no? Yes. Now in Revelation 12, we'll see Satan being called the accuser of the brethren. Look at Revelation 12. And let's read this now. Revelation 12. Now let's read this with some understanding. Let's back up to verse 9 and we'll read in slowly. Verse 9. What does verse 9 say? And the great dragon was what? Cast, Cast out. out. That old servant called the devil and Satan which deceived how much of the world? Oh, the whole world. world. He was cast out where? Yes, to the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. Then verse 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, What? Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. And what else? Power. So it says, Now, now is come salvation and strength. What? time frame is this verse talking about? What time frame is this verse talking about? 31 AD. That's important. There was war in heaven. The Bible said in verse 9, there was war in heaven and Satan was cast out. Now is the cast out let me, let me, let me pick back up so you can see in fact, I want to make sure you understand what's happening. We'll come back to that. So when there's one heaven, Satan was what? What happened when there's one heaven? Satan was what? Kicked he was out. He was cast out. All right. Verse 9 says that, and then verse 10 says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength. Is verse 9 the same as verse 10. Because the Bible says in verse 10, Satan was cast out. It says, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is what? Cast. So cast down verse 9, cast down, cast, uh, cast down verse 9, cast out, uh, down and verse 10. Is this the same time? Yes or no? Is it the same time? No. Yes or no? I'm talking to you. I need you to help me out because we, we got to go somewhere before we come to the close. And we got to go somewhere. So talk to me. Talk to me. Is, if you don't know, if you say yes, yes, no, no. But if you don't know, you say I don't know. Is this the same time? Yeah, I don't know. Not sure. Not sure. Not sure. It sounds like it is. I'm glad you said that. The first time I read that, I thought that that casting out of nine that happened in the war in heaven at the very beginning, even before man was created. I thought that was that cast out of verse 10. But when you start studying closer, you begin to start seeing that's not what happened. Verse 10 says, now watch, we're going to put it together. Verse 10 says, and I, thank you for answering this, Sister Debbie, right. Verse 10 says, and I heard a loud voice from heaven. Now notice the word now. So now is a time frame. Something just happened, right? It says, now. What happened just now? It's come, what just came? Talk to me. Salvation, Salvation. What else? and strength. So if we can find out when strength came, then we will find out when the casting down of verse 10 took place. We can say when he, when, he was, when, he, when he was cast down, strength and salvation came to the earth. Do you see that, yes or no? I see yes. That. So the Bible says in verse 10, let's read it one more time. It says in verse 10, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Now has come salvation. Now has come strength. Now has come the kingdom of God. Why did strength come? And the power is Christ. Why? For or because... The accuser of our brethren is what? Cast so down. So when Satan was cast down, what came? Strength. When Satan is cast down, what came? Salvation. When Satan is came down, cast down, what came? The kingdom of our God. So the question is, when did this strength come? Now we can do this with all that, salvation and kingdom, but we're only going to do strength. When did this strength come? Go to Romans chapter 5. Go to Romans chapter 5. Now we're letting the Bible explain itself. We found out Satan was cast out of heaven. 
at the very beginning, before man was ever created. Then we find out that the Bible is saying in verse 10 that there was a casting out again. Now, why would he be cast down twice if he's already cast down? Now, look at verse 10. We're going to find out that this 10 is a different time. What is the now of verse 10 that strength has come? Romans chapter 5. Now, in your Bible, write Romans 5, 6 next to Revelation 12, 10. And in Romans 5, 6, write Revelation 12, 10. So that you can connect and link them together when you're studying. Mm -hmm. Now, watch what this says. Romans 5, 6. Would you read that for us, Sister Carleen? Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Now, I'm not going to tell you first. <clears throat> I, want you to, I want to see if you put it together. Romans 5, verse 6. Romans 5, verse 6. Would you read it, Sister Carleen, please? When we were yet without strength. Slow down now. When we were yet without strength. Uh huh. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. All right, now I'm going to ask you a question. First, before we even link the verses together, what is this verse telling us? That there was a time when we had no strength. So there was a time when we had how much strength? No strength. But then the Bible says that strength has come. So Romans 5, 6, when did the strength come based on the text now? It says, when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died. So when did the strength come? So that tells me that the strength came when Jesus died on the cross as the Passover lamb. Am I right? Yes. This is 31 AD. Now, when did strength come? When did strength come? When he died. I can hear you. When did strength come? When he died. I didn't hear enough people tell me. No, 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 no. We got to put this together. I got to make sure you understand this, please. Amen. That's it. That's it. You put it together. So Romans 5, 6 says, in due time, Christ died. When we were yet without strength. That meant up until the cross, we had no literal strength to do something. We'll come back to that. But at the cross, strength was made accessible for us to accomplish something. So let's go back now to Revelation 12 and let's put this together. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Now Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, the Bible says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, in Revelation 12, verse 10, what did that voice say? Now, now is come, come salvation, salvation and strength. strength. Give me a time frame in Revelation 12, 10. 31. Maybe. Amen. So there now is a gap from verses 9 to 10, a gap of a little bit, uh, nearly how long? A gap of nearly what? 4,000 4, years. So question, why did he get cast down twice? Wasn't he cast down in the word heaven? He was. So why did he get cast down twice? Because he got to go back up. And how did he get to go back up? Now, so, so now you can put the, the war together that in between this word heaven, and in between Christ, uh, 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 for the cross. In between Christ down on the cross was nearly 4,000 years. And what happened was, though he was cast down, that when Adam was overcome, he got that access to heaven. Mm -hmm. And he retained that title for 4,000 years until Jesus came as the second, second Adam, Adam to win back the first dominion, dominion mm -hmm. and to give it back to mankind. Now, was he able to finish his work at the cross, or was that only the beginning? Only the beginning. So at the end of the 4,000 years, he began that work of ripping the world back from Satan, but it was not finished yet. He's not going to finish that work until the end of what? 6,000 6, years. Not on earth, but in what? Heaven. So what do you think Satan would be thinking at halftime? At the cross. We're going to make a comeback. He said, we... Sister Debbie! <laughs> Man, this is a Debbie. You on this thing. You must have woke early. Glow is about you right now. Come on, you, you, on your mind is not losing. At halftime, if you go back in the game, coach is saying, you're in the game. You are still in this game. It's not over. You are in this game. What you got to do now is take back the time. Are you following me? Yes. So at the cross, Satan wasn't saying, oh, I'm finished. I, the devil's going to, I'm going to be lost. He says, I have one more half. To win this plan of redemption to save my eternal existence. That's why, guess what happens now? Look at Revelation 12. Now we understand, we understand. Then in verse 12, it says in verse 12, let's read verse 12 together now. They are Therefore, poor, what? Rejoice. Why are you rejoicing heaven? He because you've been cast out. The devil can't come up no more. It's been settled of what's going to happen with the angels who were in heaven. And guess what it says? Continue. 
he that dwelleth. Woe to the, to the, to the inhabitants of what? The earth. earth. Why? And of the and sea. Of the sea. <laughs> For the devil has come down into you, High having great, great wrath, wrath, because he knoweth that he had but what? A short so time. Half time is over. 4,000 years have transpired. I only have 2,000 years left. I've got to do what I can. And so in 31 AD, mm -hmm. we have time. Now, we don't have time to draw it out. But we have time. We'll find out that that's when he started persecuting the Christian church in 31 AD. And with Nero and Rome, he tried to wipe out every Christian. Mm -hmm. But their blood became, guess what? Seed. And rose up the Christianity that went into the entire world. But then Satan came up with a little horn. The papacy. Who thought to change times and laws and introduce the dark ages in the entire world. And because of that, what happened to all the Christian churches that once had a knowledge of Bible truth, the sanctuary and the Sabbath and all the truths of God? What happened to all that knowledge? It went into the dark because the Bibles were burned. It was taken away. People were persecuted. And so the church lost the message of the plan of redemption that Jesus came to earth to reveal. And guess what happened? God rose up a little group of people in Revelation 12. Look at verse 17. Let's read, let's read verse 17. Verse 17 says, and, and the, the dragon, dragon was, was what? Wrong. Who is that? That's that same dragon, same Satan. Was wrong with the woman and went to make, what's the next word? War. War. What does it tell us? The war that's starting in heaven is not over. Mm. That same war is still going on. It says, he went to make war with who, everybody? With the remnant of her seed. Well, what does that church do? Which keep the what? Commandments of God. God. And what does that church have? It has the testimony, testimony of Jesus. Jesus. We'll find out Amen. that what that testimony of Jesus is is what we keep reading every week mm. along with this Bible. Now we'll go back and study that later on. But this says the Satan's upset with that church. Now tell me, why is he why is he upset with that church? Why is he attacking the remnant? Why not Babylon? Why not the other churches? Why not the Baptists and the Methodists and the Episcopalian? Why seven Adventists, the remnant church? Why? And why are we different? Because we're the only one who understands that the war is not over. Is not not over. over. Every other church believes that it ended at the cross. There's nothing to fight. But we understand, and we understand the saints from the Bible, that that war is still very much intact. And the devil is not planning on losing. And we're going to find out the devil actually believes he's going to win. Mm. He's not going to win by strength. He's going to win by technicalities. We need to find out what that's talking about. Mm. Satan, we're going to find out something. Yes, we're going to find out something. Let's read this together. Sign of the mm. time, January 16, 1896. My teachers will love this one. Let's read this together. Mm. It says, Satan what? Declare. Now watch. <clears throat> the Bible says he was an accuser mm. of the brethren. brethren. We're going to find out what these charges and the accusations are. Satan declared that it was mm. impossible. impossible. For the sons and daughters of Adam to what? Keep the law of now, stop. God. Before I even went further. Satan said it was what? Impossible. impossible. Satan said it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God. <laughs> Already it's suggesting something. What do you think is the technicality? That's impossible. So then, so then what, what, what would he have to do to create a technicality that would make the death of the cross not mean anything? Try to make it seem like Jesus wasn't a son, like that we can't do it. It's just that Jesus. Okay, well, what, did, what did God? What did God say? Came on the cross. What did God say? Came on the cross. Strength. So, if it can be proved that there's no strength, then what would it? What would it say? That God is a liar. liar. That is not true. Because God said, "What came on the cross? What came on the cross? Strength." I want to find out what that strength is for. I'm going to tell you what it's for right now. I'm going to tell you what it's for, but we'll we, we, we study it out. God at the cross gave us access to a power source that will enable us to get victory. Guess what? Over sin. sin. Do you know that it takes power? Uh, it takes power to have victory over sin. Do we have power by ourselves? No. no. We're weak. But and when Jesus died on the cross, he made available a power source that we can tie into that will give us victory over sin mm -hmm. in our lives. And the devil says, I'm going to stop this. There's only one church that understands that in order to defeat Satan, Jesus must bring his people, he must cause them to be bought and then brought back to perfection where they have victory over sin. sin. And it shows them that Jesus has what? Strength. 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 There's power in the, in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you over evil a 
victory when there's wonderful power in the blood. Well, what if we couldn't get victory over sin? What would it tell us? There's no power. There's no power in the blood to give us victory over alcohol. To give us victory over cigarettes, to give us victory over adultery and fornication and pornography and selfishness and crime and sins of all grades. Why? You know, I know I know the brother Bill wouldn't mind me telling you. Brother Bill just told me last week, he said the power of God came into his life and gave him victory over the habit of cigarettes. Didn't you tell me that? Amen. Did you know how it happened? He was the Lord just, just downloaded that power to you, didn't he? He was testifying to the glory of God. Just, it was almost as if one day the Lord just came into him and he was just like, I don't need it no more. Amen. Amen. Do you know how many people are struggling and struggling to try to do it and can't do it? Mm -hmm. But do you know that the same way he can give us victory over alcohol and drugs and sin, he can give us victory over not only some sin, but over all oh. every oh. sin. You know, some people say, well, we can give victory over some sin, but not every sin. Not who, who you think you are. But it's not about us. It's about the power of the blood. Amen. You know, we need to have so much power. That if a mosquito, Sister Carmen, came in bed, <laughs> it should come out singing. There's power in the blood. They should know it. Now it says Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God, and thus charged upon God a lack of what wisdom. wisdom. If God made man and man couldn't obey law but had to sin, then something was wrong with how God made. Man. So that would have been an indictment against not man, but an indictment against the one who created man, which was God. It says, if they could not keep the law, then there was a what? Fault. With the what? Law. So then how would the devil get a technicality? If he could show that man could not what? Keep the law. Then he would show that the fault was not man or Satan, mm -hmm. but the fault was what? The law giver. So how can he win by TKL? Technicality. How can he win? We don't keep if we the don't law. Keep the law. By preventing man from getting victory over sin. sin. Mm -hmm. And by so doing, it would say if they could if, if they could not keep the law, then there was fault with the what? Oh, yeah. Men who are under the control of Satan do what? Mm -hmm. Repeat these accusations. So Satan said it first. What if a Seventh-day Adventist theologian was teaching this? What would that tell us about a theologian? They're under the, under the control Satan. of Satan. What if an entire university that trains ministers were teaching you? Under the control of Satan. And Jesus came to make us free. Now, this says men who are under the control of Satan do what? Now, don't forget that. I'm going I'm, I'm to come back to that. Men, not man, but what? Men. What does that suggest? More than one. Men who are under the control of Satan repeat these accusations against God and asserting that men could not what? Keep the law of God. Of God. Now, next question, so again, what must Satan do in order to try to win the great controversy? He can't stop Jesus from dying on the cross, but he can stop Jesus from coming out of the most holy place. Listen to me. If Christ comes out the most holy place, the war is over. Amen. So Satan's game plan is to keep Jesus where? In the most holy place until the time runs out. out. Don't let him come out. And guess what? Jesus cannot come out and just somebody has what? Victory, Victory over, over sin. sin. So then what does Satan keep us doing? What would he have to do to us on earth sin. in order to win the great controversy? Keep keeps yes. us sinning. I want to ask you a question. Are we sinning on this earth? Mm -hmm. Yes. What is the average person, the Christian? I'm not talking about the world. I'm not this Christian. He would say, I'm only a human. human. And if that is the conclusion we come to, then Satan will win the great controversy. But God rose up a church called Seventh-day Adventists and gave us a message that would show us that there's power in the blood of the Lamb, not only to talk about it and sing about it, but to practice it in daily life. Amen. This message is under attack. Satan went to make war with this message. But God's going to have a revival message. What do you say? Amen. Now, this is Seventh-day Adventists. Now, this says, Jesus humbled himself, told his divinity of humanity in order that he might stand as the head and representative of the human family and by both precept and example condemn sin in the flesh and give the lie to what? Satan. You know, somebody can overcome in human flesh and I'm going to take on man's flesh. I'm going to live a life. Question, did Jesus sin, yes or no? No. The Bible says, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Let's go to Hebrews 4 quickly. Hebrews the 4th chapter. Hebrews chapter 4, turn there quickly. Hebrews chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says in Hebrews 4, beginning in verse 14. Hebrews 4. Look what the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 
and Hebrews 4, verse 15, excuse me, Hebrews 4, verse 15. The Bible, let's find verse 14. Hebrews 4, verse 14. The Bible says, seeing then, in fact, would you read this for us, Sister Debbie? Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heaven. Not on earth, but in heaven. Who is this priest? Jesus, Jesus. the Son of God. <laughs> Let us hold fast our profession. Verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. That's a double negative. So if I have not a high priest that cannot be touched, then what do I have? A high priest that can be touched. So when we're weak, God feels it. If we're sick and hurting and sinful, God feels it and says, just come to me. Come to my throne of grace and I'll give you help. Continue. But was in all points. How many points? All points. Tempted. Like as we are. Yet what? Yet without sin. So Amen. then Jesus, at the end of the 4,000 years, Jesus had victory over what? Sin. sin. Jesus was sinless. And it was because a sinless Savior died that our sinful souls can be set free. Mm -hmm. It was because this man, this high priest, this Jesus did this. Do you know that we have a man? We've got to understand that man so that what he did, he can do through what? Me. Us. Because guess what? Satan says Jesus did it. But I can still win on a technicality because in order for the God's people to be redeemed, it must be demonstrated not only can Jesus do it, but every son and daughter of humanity that understands Jesus can demonstrate that they can have victory over what? Sin. Sin. All of them. That's the plan. Now, when we look at the picture, guess what the picture is going to say? The picture is going to say that at the end of 6,000, every saint will have victory over sin. That's Amen. the picture. I don't care what the Greek says or the Hebrew says, all the other so-called scholars and permanent head damaged persons, the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. They're not trying. They're not slipping and sliding. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Jesus. God has given us strength. We can do it with through him. Fact is where you said that the plan of redemption had a yet. What's that word? Broader, Broader and deeper, deeper purpose than the salvation. Now, normally when we think about the plan of redemption, we think that the greatest thing in the plan of redemption is salvation. That's not the greatest part of the plan of redemption. Does it do salvation? It doesn't. This is why you have some people say, well, I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be brought back to perfection. Look at the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross, he was saved. That's true. You know, the man in the last moments of his life, and give his heart to Jesus, and because Jesus died on the cross, that man, if he's faithful to God, up to the light he knows, can be saved. Mm -hmm. But that would never finish the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption is bigger than one person being saved. The plan of redemption is much bigger than a person in the last moment of his life giving his life to Christ. The plan of redemption means not only must a man die for Jesus, mm -hmm. but somebody has to demonstrate they can live, live for, for Jesus. Jesus. You know, it's easier to die for Jesus than to live for him. Yes. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. Well, then what is it about? It was not for what? This alone. What is this alone? Salvation of man. So did he, did, was the plan of redemption include salvation of man? Yes. yes, it does. But it's deeper than that. It's heavier than that. There's much more at stake. It says it was not just alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of what? This little world. Might regard the law of God as it should be regarded. Now notice it says not world, but what? Little. Well, that tells us that God has one. Other world meaning. that are much bigger. It says that the heavens of the world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded. But what was the plan of redemption really for? It was to vindicate, vindicate the, the character of God of before earth. The universe. The entire universe. How much is at stake? How much is at stake? The entire, entire universe. universe. Everything is at stake. And it didn't finish at the cross. It's still at stake. And Satan can win everything by a technicality. What's the technicality? Either to stop Jesus from getting victory over sin and dying, or to stop humanity from getting victory over sin at the close of probation. And you can't stop Jesus. Why? It's he done. He came and gone. Yes. He did. He has one more opportunity. Half time is over. He has one more chance to win the game. His only chance is to stop humanity from being brought back to perfection. This is it. From the first of the Great Controversy, it had been upon the what? Law. So what is the issue of the Great Controversy? What is the central issue of the Great Controversy? The law. Now, can we go to the Bible and move that? 
Can we go to the Bible and prove that in this warfare, the real issue is the law of God? Can we go back to the Bible and prove that? Yes. Right there in Revelation. That's many places. But right in Revelation. Go back to Revelation. You go to Revelation chapter 12. You remember that war that started in heaven? In Revelation 12 verse 7. Now watch Revelation 12 verse 7. What was that war in heaven about? If I ask you what that war is about. In 1939. Uh, when Hitler uh, crossed over and went into uh, Poland. It set some things off. Hitler, do you know what Hitler was upset about? Did anybody know what Hitler was upset about? Historically, what, what was going on? You know what Hitler was upset about? The Treaty of Versailles. That was in World War I. In World War I, after the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the, the Germans, he felt, got the worst end of the stick. They had to pay reparations. They couldn't have any armaments. They couldn't have any military. They kept them under control. They lost all of their land. And so the Dutch land, or uh, Germany, he felt like everything was gone. And he felt that it was because of the Jews that came into the army. And so he was upset at this. So when he got back to power, guess what he wanted to take back? Everything. All of the land that was supposed to be first before. So when he went to Poland, he said Poland was a risen mine. And the people didn't fight him because they knew they were like, Austria, mine. So he rolled in, no fight. And so he continued to go on, but they began to start recognizing that he wasn't going to stop with Austria <laughs> and Poland and France. He wasn't going to stop with, uh, with, uh, with all these other surrounding countries. He wanted how much? The world. The world dominance. Do you know that one person who was a seven at Venice in Germany, that eventually the message came up to the top of the line and they showed him Daniel 2. And he was a seven day at Venice in Hitler's army and said, you will never take over the world. Mm. Because the Bible says that God won't let it happen. That who's going to get the kingdom again? It's Jesus Christ himself. Mm. I wish I had time to go to this story. I don't. Uh, but anyway, so in that process, there was a, what Hitler was trying to do, there was a reason for it. Are you following me? Yes. Now, but what he wanted in 1939 is the same thing he wanted in 1944. If you find out what the issue was at the beginning of the war, you find out what the issue is at the end, end of the, end of the war. war. It just takes a period of time to fight the war. Are you following what I'm getting at? Right. So what was that war about in heaven? Anybody know what that war was about? Revelation 12, 7 says there was war in heaven, but it didn't tell you what the war was about, does it? Mm -mm. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be like God. You can see that Isaiah 14. That's a good, good, good point. You go to Isaiah 14, you see that? How do you know there was over the law, Brother Smokey? Is it because the seven that is that brainwash you? Have they hit you over the head? That's what the, the band is? Yeah. There. Is, that, is, that, is that what it's coming? What did the seven that do to you? No. Do you see that we have to be able to go back to the Bible? Are you following what I'm getting at? Yes. To show that Seventh Adventism is the religion of what? The Bible. And I want you to be able to go back to the Bible and show that that war in heaven is a part of something very specific that happened on this earth. It's the same war. Mm -hmm. It is the last part. So I'm saying, well, how can you change locations? Well, in Germany, they may start in one place, but then they go to another nation, fighting in Africa, fighting over here. So the battle travels, but guess what the center of the battleground is? Battleground Earth. Mm -hmm. This is where the war is going to be fought and won. You know, Virginia was a serious place in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Virginia was very serious. It was a very place of battle. It was very, very, very historic in the Civil War. And I believe in prophetically, it's going to be very serious again at the end of the Second Civil War. I believe God brought us here for such a time as this, as this thing is developing. We've got to understand it. So now, if we can find out what the end of the war is about, then we know what the beginning. Because he declares the end from the beginning. beginning. Go to Revelation 12. Go to the end of the war. Look at verse 17. Let's see what the war is about. Would you read that again, Brother Smokey? We'll know this telling you. know, I'm having brainwashed. Nobody hit me over the head. <laughs> verse 17. What does it say in verse 17, Brother Smokey? And the dragon was wroth with the woman. We know that dragon represents Satan. The woman represents the church. We'll study that another time. And went to make war with the remnant of her. Oh, wait, 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 wait. He went to make what? War. Same dragon. Mm. Same war. war. Continue. Which keep the commandments of God. So what was central in the war? The commandments of God. Give me another name for the commandments of God. The law. So what was central in this war? The law. So why is he attacking the seven of his church? Because they understand the importance of what? The law. The law. Is a sign of a part of that law. Oh, yes. It's the heart of that law. So what's going to be at the heart of the great controversy? The Sabbath. What's the issue going to be about in the very last thing? Now, so then America in Revelation 13, when America, the two-horned beast, speaks as a dragon, as we studied in our coming events class, when America speaks as a dragon, she enters the war against the law of God. Mm. What is America going to do to enter the war against the law of God? She's going to pass a law that is going to try to nullify the law of God. Yeah. 
What, what, what law is that? The National, National Sunday, Sunday Law. What was the Pope talking about? Sunday. What's the climate change about? Sunday. What is all this, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the coronavirus about? Do you know that they say it's all of this? They link together. Mm. So we're going to find out all of this is leading back here and who really started the change against the law. Satan. Satan. Because his charge is, if he can make it seem like something's wrong with the law. Mm. If a law is perfect, why do you need to change it? You don't. You don't. Why do you change something? If it's not right. If it's so if the law had to be changed and the law was not perfect, then who made the law was not perfect. Right. So then that means that you need a new ruler. Okay. Mm. So Satan attacked the law to take over the universe. Mm. Yeah. And if the angels and the unfallen worlds could be made to believe the law was bad, faulty, needed to be changed, then they would think that there needed to be a change of the king of that earth or that universe or that ruler. Do you see? Yes. How much is that state? Everything. Did he take the earth angels? Yes. Who was more intelligent, angels or man? Angels. angels. So if he took angels, how do you think he can take man? Okay. He took Adam in perfection. Intelligent mind. What do you think he's going to do to us in these last days if we don't have Jesus? Well, okay. We have to understand how much is at stake. stake. Now look at this. So we can see the issue is over the law of God. From the first, the great controversy had been upon what? The law of God. Satan had sought to prove that God was what? Unjust. Unjust. Not fair. Now, if I told you to keep a law that you couldn't keep, that would be what? Unjust. That would be fair. That his law was what? Faulty. Faulty. And that the good of the universe required it to be what? Changed. In attacking the law, he aimed to overthrow the authority of its Honor. author or lawgiver. In the controversy was to be shown whether the divine statutes were defective and subject to change or whether they were what? In perfect, perfect. law liberty. Perfect and what else? Immutable. What does immutable mean? Unchanging. Unchanging. I want to ask you a question. How can Satan win by technicality then? Anybody can answer now. We should be on a uh, foundational platform. How could Satan win by technicality? Think we, we just went through it. What would Satan have to do? Okay, what is the issue? The law. The law. The law. And what about the law? He has, he's, he's really, the real issue is he's trying to take the throne right. and become his. Right. And in order to do that, he has to prove the law is strong. Yes. Because if God has run the government perfectly, why do you need any rules? You don't. Right. You need a revolution because the government is not run best. Right. So Satan says we need a revolution, a revolt, because God is not running it. He's holding us back from a greater good. And the problem is his law. And if you study the law, you'll know why he hates the law and why the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath says, worship the creator and not the creature. Mm -hmm. But nobody else created. So that law prohibits any creature from ever getting control. Amen. Mm -hmm. So in order to get control, you have to destroy a law that emphasizes the worship of the cre creature or creator by the creature. Mm -hmm. And so he has to talk the law and the Sabbath being the primary target. So he has to prove that God was unjust, unfair. That his law was faulty, the good of the universe required to be changed, and attacking the law, he ain't going to overthrow its authority of his what? Author. So then, what would he have to do now to win because Jesus already died on the cross? Right. What is the last technicality? His first technicality was, I got Adam in sin, mm -hmm. it proved that the law cannot be kept. Mm -hmm. But Jesus came in the second Adam and showed that Adam could keep the law. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's one thing, and he made power available at the cross. He has to get the last generation he not has. to keep the law. And what would that show? That the law can't be kept. And so it would that prove that no maybe strength. God could do it, but how do we know that Jesus didn't use some power that's not available to what? Uh, to us. Because wasn't he God? Uh, mm -hmm. But you and I are not God. Mm -hmm. To vindicate God's character, not only has Jesus to live in humanity, victory over sin, but he has to have humanity who are not God. Mm -hmm. to live the same life that Christ lived. Mm -hmm. Are you following? Yes. And if he could stop humanity mm -hmm. from revealing the strength and power to get victory over sin, it would then say that Jesus was trying to trick us mm -hmm. that he did something that you and I can't do. do. Mm -hmm. And he would win, how? By Satan would then take this Universe. To the angels and to the unfallen worlds, and guess what would happen to the universe? Revolt. The whole universe would be revolt against God. Mm -hmm. And then guess what would have to happen to him? If everybody eventually said, "Well, Satan was right," guess what would eventually have to happen? Because God 
would then not be able to, he wouldn't destroy Satan because he was Saudi and queen. And guess what would happen? Oh, oh no, curse. <sighs> I'm going to show you. Oh, but that, 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 that's not going to happen. Praise God. I'm going to tell you before. It's not going to happen. Amen. 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 But if it would have happened, the wages of sin is what? Death. Yeah. So then God would have had to step back. The father, like what he did to his son, he would have to do to every son and daughter of Adam. What happened at the cross? Because of sin, what did the father do? He stepped back. Amen. And what did Jesus do? He died. Yes. What would have to happen to every sinner then if, the, if God stepped back because he lost the converse? Everybody would die. Everybody would die. Satan would die? Mm -hmm. Yes. The all the angels would die? Yes. yes. Humanity would die? And what would be left? Mm -hmm. Just God. The earth would be in a, a desolate wilderness. Mm -hmm. And the only person that will be there is God. We're going to find out that God is going to switch the equation. And what Satan planned to do to God is going to happen upon himself at the mm -hmm. end of the day of, of atonement. We're going to prove this. Now watch. When Satan was thrust out of, thrust out of heaven, he determined to make the earth what? Yes. Now, do we see that from the Bible? Yes or no? Yes. yes. When he tempted and overcame Adam and Eve, he thought that he had gained possession of this world because, said he, they had chosen me as their ruler. Do we prove that from the Bible? Yes. He claimed that it was impossible that forgiveness should be granted to the sinner, and therefore the fallen race was his rightful subjects, and the world was what? Yes. yes. But God gave his own son. Praise God. Amen. One equal with himself to bear the penalty of transgression. And thus he provided a way by which man might be restored to his favor and brought where? Back, Back to the eternal. Amen. It says Christ undertook to redeem man and to rescue the world from the grasp of Satan. The great controversy had begun in heaven was to be decided where? In, in the, the very world. world. On the very same field, field that Satan claimed as his, he went into his own hometown and said, look, I'm going to win it in your court. Amen. On your field that you claim is yours, I'm going to win it there. Mm. And he started this at the cross. Mm. But guess what? The work didn't finish at the cross. It only began. began. There's one last place of technicality. You got to understand what the work is. We study what the work is. The work is twofold. Represented by the lamb and the priest. The first work is that we have to be what? But. but. Did he do that, yes or no? Yes. Where did he do that? On the On cross. cross. And then the second work is that we must be what? Brought. Brought where? Into the most holy place. What happens to the sinner when he's brought into the most holy place? He's brought back, back to, to perfection. perfection. Now, what demonstrates that he's been brought back to perfection? The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the what? Perfection. Of the character. If he can't perfect us, his, he's dishonored. His character is not vindicated. Mm. What demonstrates that we... Or Christ has done the work in the sanctuary. Our Savior was the master of heaven, the king of glory, but he laid aside his royal robe, became the crown, and clothed his divinity with what, everybody? Humanity. Humanity. That he might know for himself the sufferings and temptations of human beings. We read in Hebrews, he was tempted in all points, mm -hmm. like as we are yet without sin. Then it says, let's read this together. He, he came, came to, to be their what? Surety. To overcome in their behalf. To live for them a what? Sinless life. That was the first part. Did he win that technicality? He, yes, did. he did. But that's not it. That through his power, power at the cross, strength, the power source was made available. Yes. And through his power, they, not Christ now, but they, who are they? Us. Uh, humanity. That through his power, they might obtain, talk to me somebody, the, the victory over sin. There are two places of technicality. One on earth as a lamb, one with the priest is doing. As a lamb, if he could have made Jesus sin to become a spot full lamb of God, then no redemption. No redemption. But Jesus was a what? Spotless lamb. He was sinless. Jesus lived a sinless life. But this last place of technicality in the second half, mm -hmm. If Satan can stop man from having access to the power source made available at the cross so that we obtain victory over sin, Satan will win by default, by technicality, and he will get a TKO. Mm. Are you with me? Oh, yes. To be redeemed means to cease from what? Sin. sin. Now, when does this happen? Go to Leviticus 16. Now, what did I tell you to stay homework? What did I tell you to stay? Leviticus 16. Now, the whole day... Do you know that Leviticus 16 is only for one day? Do you know what date of the Leviticus 16 is? So how can I know the date of Leviticus 16? What are you telling me? 
<laughs> Leviticus 16 was the 10th day, day of the 7th month. Now, go to Leviticus 16. And then after we read this, I'm going to call on uh, Brother Bill. After we read Leviticus 16, after that, he's going to read for me Matthew uh, 19 and verse 26. Not yet, though. After Leviticus 16, then we're going to read that in just a moment. So you can get in position, please. Let's go to Leviticus 16. Now, the biggest 16 is the day of what? Atonement. We're going to go back to this and study it some more, but I want you to see something on it because I, I need to get, bring this out. Please just give me a few more minutes. Can you give me just a few more minutes? Can you give me some minutes? All right. I just want yes. to get this point out. The biggest 16. The biggest 16. Now, what I'm going to do is go to the end of the day of atonement because I want you to see something about the end of the day of atonement. And we're going to look at this a couple of times before we conclude. But I want you to see this. Now, how do you know I'm going to the end of the day of atonement? I'm going to read something. Let's read verse 20. Let's read verse 20 together. What does it say? And when, let's all read Leviticus 16, verse 20. And, and when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. All right. Now, this is the end of the day of atonement. Now, how do I know this is the end of the day of atonement? Because it didn't say 3 o'clock or 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. How do I know it's the end of the day of atonement? When he had made an end. The, the event, number one, the event, by bringing the live coat. But the Bible itself says, and when he shall make an end. So that tells us he's not beginning something, he's what? And 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 something. So this is the finishing of his work in the most holy place, which will finish his work as the high priest. That's the last thing that has to happen in the plan of redemption. So as this is taking place, what happens at the very end? You remember at the beginning of the day, there are five animals of offerings that's brought. A couple of them for the priest in his house, and the others for the congregation, all who represent the people of God. Now, you remember all year long, when a man sinned, what did he do every time a man sinned? The whole sacred service was about sin. It, when a man sinned, what did he do? You can read in the Leviticus 4 5. When he sins, he will bring an offering. If he believes in the plan of redemption, if he believes in Jesus in the Bible, he believes in God in the sea, he will bring his lamb. Yeah. Because remember, let them make me a sin and I may dwell among them. He will bring that lamb to the sanctuary, that offering. And then he will put his hands upon the what? Head. Head of the lamb. He was confessing over that lamb his sins. Yeah. And in symbol, the sin was being transferred from the sinner to the substitute. And then all of a sudden, then the man, not the priest, but the man would take the knife hmm. and slit the throat of that priest while he looked into the eyes That's of the lamb. And as he looked into that little lamb, mm -hmm. and he slit his throat, how do you think the lamb was looking? You think the lamb, I'm going to kill you. Is that the lamb was looking? Oh, yes. That peaceful so lamb. So innocent. Almost looking like, why are you killing me? Oh. And he would have to cut. When that Jewish knife was so sharp, he would drop a pig one, he would split. He would cut his throat, and the lamb wouldn't even feel it at first. It was hardly felt. The physical pain was hardly, you know, if you get cut by a razor, it's so sharp, you almost don't feel it until later. We're told in the Spirit of Prophecy that when Jesus died on the cross, his physical pain was hardly felt because there was a deeper pain of the soul being separated from you and me. Mm. And so you notice now that that lamb slipped throat, blood oozing out at the hands of the sinner. Mm. That it was for your sins that Jesus had to die, my sins. Then the priest would take not the lamb, he would take what? The blood. What was in the blood now, symbolically? The sin. sin. And he would take that blood into the sanctuary and go to the veil and sprinkle it seven times. What was he putting on the veil? Blood. blood. What was that symbolically transferring to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the veil? Sin. sin. So in tight, sin was being transferred from the sin through the substitute to the sanctuary. Right. This was happening all year long. So what was happening to the sanctuary all year long? Is getting clean all year long. Is that right? right. Dirty. 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 Later on, you will find out that's why the altar of incense was right there at that lamb. You ever smell yes. blood before? When the person dead, you smell the smell of death. Mm -hmm. You ever smell a man die? You ever smell the smell, the smell of death? It's a terrible smell. You know when an animal, even an animal did, even if you never saw an animal dead, you know when it's something stink or uh, the smell of death. Can you imagine millions of people in the wilderness and you read how much Israel sinned? You can imagine how many lambs were killed. All year long, that was sprinkled. But at the very end of the year, when the last day of operation of that sanctuary was called the Day of Atonement. Um, that word was not getting sent into the sanctuary. You know what that word was? Getting it out. Getting it sent out of the sanctuary. 
That's why it was called the cleansing of the sanctuary. And that took place only on the Day of Atonement, which was the tenth day of the seventh month. Very important. So he's at the end of this day. He brought these offerings. The last part of the ceremony was to bring a live goat. The other goat died. His blood brought in to cleanse the sanctuary. That represented Jesus. But then there was a live goat who was not yet dead, and that sin was going to be put upon him. I wonder who that goat represented. Ezekiel. It represented Satan himself. Mm -hmm. We were getting a picture of what was going to happen at Satan at the end of the day of the Leviticus 16 says, as we verse 20, and when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle congregation and the altar, he shall bring the what? Live oh, goat. Live goat. Now hold your thumb here. We'll come right back there. We'll come back to that. We saw what Satan's plan was. Satan had declared that it was impossible for the sons of God and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God. And thus charged upon God a lack of wisdom and love. If they could not keep the law, then there was fault with what? The lawgiver. What does that next word say? Men. If men who are under the control of Satan do what? Repeat. Repeat these accusations. Now in action. Have there risen any men among seven Adventists that repeated? Well, what is the accusation first? What is the accusation? The law can't that, be kept. That the man. law can't be kept can't. by man. by mankind. And any, 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 any among us, we know the world, what the world says, but any among seven Adventists? Yeah. Who is that man? Epinstall. No, no. What did that man say? It can't be done. There's another man. I like that man. <laughs> What was that man's name? Andreas. We studied him last week. This is where the shift in the church came between these two men. This man said that through the power of Jesus, on the day of atonement, God is going to get a people who gets victory over sin that will vindicate the character of God in the last generation. This man said impossible. Not even by the power of the indwelling Christ can man get victory over sin. Our religion would be changed. This is a major part of our identity being stolen. We looked at this last week. Here's heaven stolen. We see him. We saw he was a theologian. His representations on the law and the covenants of the 1952 Bible Conference was highly influential upon the theology of what? The, the church. church. Heffenstall was one of the most influential scholars to come out, not for, but what? Against M.L. Andreas is what? Who just teaches that through the power of Christ, Jesus in the most holy place will bring man back to the place where not only was he bought but brought back to perfection to sinless condition where he has victory over sin so that Jesus can finish the work in the most holy place. That's the message. Mm -hmm. Now, it says, while he was, the, the people, these people are for him, they say, while holding the pillar doctrine of Adventist pioneers, which is false, he moved forward on the understanding of such issues as the human nature of Christ and the atonement. You'll see all those go together. When you misunderstand this, you'll misunderstand the nature of Christ, you misunderstand atonement. It says, the atonement of the cross was a continual ministry in heaven and the anti-typical one. The atonement. Beyond these issues, he stressed other things. He stressed the what? Impossibility. The impossibility of humanly achieving what some people think as sinless perfection. Now, who said that first? Lucifer. Satan. But then it's where it says that men under the control of Satan will what? Repeat. So what was heaven saw doing? Repeating the accusation of Satan that would make Satan win by technicality. Mm. Who do you think made that come to the center of the church? Satan. Because Satan. all world believes this. Already, it says Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons of God, daughters of the law. Men who are under the control of Satan repeat these accusations. We continue. We find out. It says, while Henry Starr's writing for influential, his teaching career was much more so. He influenced a generation of what? Preachers. And religion teachers through his college and cemetery. Seminary. Is there, what is a cemetery about? The no, okay. Seminary. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Things highlighted by Heaven Star would echo in the classroom through such teachers as Hans Lurandel and Raoul Dieterson. And in the pulpit, you don't remember those names. You remember his name? I remember Morris Vendor. Morris Vendor. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. This man was led by Heaven Star. 
These people were hailed in the 70s and 80s as bringing revival information, telling us that if you just accept Jesus, that you have nothing to do with victory over sin. No man can get victory over sin. Jesus did it all at the cross. In Pangenical, which was nothing more than the wine of Babylon. Mm -hmm. It says, throughout the 70s, one, one, uh, one of Heaven's Star's protege, one of his great students, would eventually attain special visibility in the church. Heaven Star recognized the talents of what? Desmond Ford. Desmond Ford. That was taught by Heaven Star. Mm -hmm. It says in the early 1960s, they both fought against, so Desmond Ford and Heaven Star were a tag team against what they believed to be the excess and distortions of what? Andreessen. Perfectionist theology. But Ford would eventually move beyond what? Heaven Star. So Ford went further than Heaven Star. They take it. So much so that Heaven Star was surprised and shocked. Heaven Star was shocked at how far that Ford had swung to left biblically and doctrinally. Desmond Ford apostatized. But heaven's trying to understand it was because of him. <laughs> he don't need to be shot. He planted a seed. We're told this would take place. Who is that man? It's it's the Lord. Lord. It's the Lord. This is the man that the history says changed the church. We'll come back and study what he did. But the question is, not what did they just teach. The issue is between, not so much what man says, but what does God say? Did he give us a picture, yes or no? He does. Yes. Where's the picture? The sanctuary. The sanctuary. Now the question is, if the sanctuary says that in the final generation that somebody is going to be brought back to a sinless state, then which one are you going to believe? The man or the sanctuary? The sanctuary. The man or PhD? The sanctuary or PhD? The sanctuary. Thy way, O oh God. Now, in Leviticus 16, let's read it again. What's in that sanctuary? We'll go back. You come back to the message. In fact, let me show you what the fourth said. Ford was an Australian theologian who studied evangelicalism within the Seventh Adventist Church. He was dismissed in 1980 from denominational teaching. He would attack the investigative judgment, David Toman, all that. It says he continued, and I move on. It says Ford was a primary opponent of what? Perfectionism. Why are they targeting this? This is the issue within the Seventh Adventist Church. Ford believed that victory over the guilt of sin was provided at the cross. Victory over the power of sin is the work of a lifetime, and victory over the presence of sin, meaning victory over sin in our daily lives, occurs at the return of Christ Jesus. We're going to find out if we can't get rid of sin, if Jesus comes back, the great controversy is not one. The great controversy will be what? The great controversy will be what? Lost. Let's read this together. Ford held that victory over the presence of sin does not occur during this lifetime, so sin what? Continues among the saints up to the return of Jesus Christ. You're going to find out the whole great controversy will be lost by TKO. That took place. But that is what the leading Seventh Adventist scholars began teaching yes. in 1980, taught in all of our universities, taught in all of our schools. Now every pastor trained this way has yes. come out believing this unless he studies for himself. Mm -hmm. You've got to, and how do you know the difference? If a man says, I study for myself, you believe that, don't you? No. <laughs> by your fruits. You've got to go back to the Bible, to the law and to the what? Testimony. This is what this man said. But now here's that man. Guess what this man taught? Now that man, the, the other man, Stephen Stephenson, Ford, said you couldn't do it. But let's see what the man Jesus taught. In his book, Sanctuary Service, and Jesus taught, the final demonstration of what the gospel can do and in and for humanity is still in the future. Christ, Christ showed the way. Amen. He took a human body. Is that what the Bible teaches? Yes. Or yes. Not? And in that body demonstrated the power, power of God. God. Men are to not just look at that, but are to what? Follow oh. his example and prove. That what God did where? In Christ. He, God, can do in what? Every, Every human, human being. How many human beings? Every. Who submits to him. The world is awaiting this demonstration. When it has been accomplished, the end, end will, will come. come. God would have fulfilled his plan. plan. And will have shown himself true. And Satan a liar. liar. What was his lie? That, that the law man can't keep the law of God. God. His government will stand what? Vindicated. And the only way that Satan can win is if he can cause the final generation not to have victory over sin. sin. Do you see the issue? Yes or not? Yes. That's the work. That's the work of redemption right there. Here's the picture. That's what God said. Now my question is, what would happen if God could not bring us back to perfection where we have victory over sin? What would happen? Now, you should be able to put yeah. this together. Tell me, what would happen? Nobody can tell me what happened? 
What would happen if, if God at the very end, at the end of 6,000 years, Satan if would God win. could not bring us back to perfection at the end of 6,000, what would happen in the great numbers? Satan would win. You know what Jesus would have to do? He would have to bring the scapegoat, which represents what? Satan. Satan. You have to bring Satan, which represents Satan. We're going to find out. The only thing he could do is present him to the universe and say he was right. Mm. I couldn't do it. Mm. Never. What would happen to the angels? You think they'll believe God still? If he said, if Satan, if God said Satan was right, because God's going to tell the truth. Uh -huh. If God couldn't do it, you know what he's going to say? I was wrong. I um, can't do it. Can't do it. Oh. And the whole universe would see that Satan was right, and Satan would take control of the entire universe. Mm. That was his original plan. Now, is that going to happen? Yes or no? Never. Never. Uh -huh. Never. Uh -huh. See, if the plan of man is redemption to fail, Satan would what? Retain. Retain the kingdom, what's he then claim? We prove this now all now in Scripture now. Is that true? Yes. And if he should succeed, he flattered himself that he would reign, rule, control, and opposition to the God of heaven. We saw that. We saw that this work started in, uh, on the earth. But then we found out, remember we read this? I mean, back here. Yeah. Not that one. It says... As Christ felt his unit, in unity with the Father broken up, he feared that in his human nature he would be un unable to endure the coming conflict with the powers of darkness. In the wilderness of temptation, the destiny of the human race had been at what? Stay. Now what we're trying to understand, how much is that? Stay. Now it says, Christ was then conqueror. Now the tempter had come for the last fearful struggle. For this he had been preparing during the three years of Christ's ministry. Let's read this together. Everything was that with him. If Christ could be what? Overcome. Was Adam overcome? Yes. If the second Adam, if Christ could overcome, the earth would become what? Satan's kingdom. And the human race would be forever in his power. power. This is the issue. What the issues of the conflict before? Now, do you understand? Did Christ lose or did he win? Win. win. Well, that's your question. So then the game is over when he went at the cross. Is that right? Uh -oh. No, no. That was just what? Half time. time. Satan got up from the cross and said in 31 AD, I know that I have but a short, short time, time to prevent from the church from understanding the plan of redemption. So they can tie into the power source made available at the cross, come to Jesus, their high priest, and get victory over sin that I may be destroyed on time. time. Somebody says it's impossible. Would you read, Brother Bill, Matthew 19, verse 26? Watch what it says. Matthew 19, verse 26. What does it say? He said, with men this is what? Impossible. Impossible. Can God bring us back to perfection? Yes or no? Yes. Because with God, all these problems. He has enough power. But can we just say, yes, he has enough power? What's going to demonstrate he has enough power? Showing. Living. It must be shown in our lives. Watch it. What would happen then if we could not get victory over sin? The earth will become what? Satan's, Satan's kingdom. And the human race will be forever in his power until man die. Because the ways of sin is what? Death. Yeah. And God will be all alone. Ever since this fall, Satan has been at work, Heavenly Fathers, we get ready to bring this message to a close. In these last few minutes, Lord, help us to tie this together so we can see if ever there was a time to get ready, it's now. If we understood this, Lord, we would not even want to go home. We would be afraid. Mm -hmm to do anything that would take us from Jesus because everything is at stake. Oh, and, it's, and you are counting on us, Lord. You have done your part, and now in heaven you want to do it, but you cannot force us. We must choose to let you into our hearts to bring us back to perfection. Okay. Please, dear God, help us to understand in these last few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Is this serious, yes or no? Yes. yes. Ever since this fall, now, now you will tell me this is true. You know this is true. Rovino Herald, March 9, 1886. We proved this from Scripture. Ever since his fall, when he was cast out, Satan has been where? At, At work. work to establish himself as what? Ruler of this earth. Is that not what we've been showing you? That, yes. that, that, that his whole game plan. To sit on the throne of the universe. He saw the sacrificial offering. He's talking about the sanctuary. Which had been ordained to represent Christ as dying for the race. And he tried in every way possible to so pervert them that the people would lose sight of their true meaning from the Jewish age down to the what? Present time. Satan's, give me the next word. War. So that means the war is still going on. We prove the war is still going on. Satan's warfare has been directed against the Son, Son of, of God, God, but he failed. Christ went back to heaven victorious. 
What's the last technicality? And his what? Work. Well, what is the work of the Son of God in heaven? Not only for us to be bumped, but for us to be brought right. back, back to, to perfection. perfection when we have victory over sin. sin. And he must do it by the end of the day of atonement. Now, this says Satan's warfare has been directed against the Son of God and his work. And he, Satan, still what? Flatters himself. himself that he will obtain the victory. Now, why does Satan flatter himself? Because if you look at us, what have we been doing for nearly 6,000 years? Sin. 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 Who is the only person in 6,000 years that has lived a sinless life? Jesus. And so, what would it look like at the end of the game? That he's winning. He's going to win. Because if it's never been done in 6,000 years, and not just one human being, but every child of God in the final generation has to be brought back to this day. Every one of them. The entire church. We're going to show you. That's what the picture says. Now, do you think that God knows you're talking about? God says, I'm saying, says, look, at the end of 6,000, when our plan is done, I'm going to have a church where every one of them, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, every one is going to look just like me. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. I don't care how simple he's been, how many mistakes he's made. How many problems he's had in his home, in his life. How much things he watched on television. How many wrong thoughts and imperfections. How many sins in his life. I'm going to show that I have power to buy him and then fix him and bring him back to perfection. Amen. I have the power. Amen. But what would it look like if you said that and then 6,000 years later we're still sinning? Mm. Would it vindicate God's care? No. Would it make him look like a fool? Thank Here's you. a father. Oh, my child, I've trained them right. They will never lie to me. They have told me everything is all right. Then you turn around and your child did exactly what you told them about to do. How do you feel now? You don't feel vindicated. You feel like a fool. Do we want to make God feel like that? No. Satan flatters himself. Here's the circle. God declared the end from where? The beginning. Let's go to Genesis 3. Look at this now. We'll put this together. We're coming to a close. For Genesis 3. This is the real issue. This is serious. We're here, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 3. God declared the end from the beginning. Here was the, here was the first pronunciation of what God says going to happen to vindicate the spirit. This is the plan right here. Genesis 3.15. We know before you were looking at this, this is dealing with the unfolding of the plan of redemption. Let's read verse 15 again. What does it say in verse 15? One of the most powerful texts in all the Bible. It says, and I will put what? Enmity between the serpent, Satan, and, and the woman, woman, and between thy seed and her seed. But it says, compare what? Seed. And it, that is the seed, shall do what? Bruise thy head. head. And now shall do what? Bruise his so heel. was the first prophecy made when Satan overcame Adam and thought that the world was his? God took Satan, serpent, that old serpent. Mm -hmm. He said, listen, I'm going to crush your head. I'm going to do what? Crush your crush head. head. As we said. I'm going to win. I'm going to be victorious. There's going to be a conflict. How do we know there's going to be a conflict? War. It says, uh, it shall bruise thy head. I'm going to bruise thy head, but thou shalt bruise his head. What did that tell us? There was what? Conflict. conflict. And somebody's going to get hurt that's on the right side. Right. Mm -hmm. They're going to be bruised, but not their head. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to be a conflict. Here we see this. We look at the screen. Here's a, a heel. Now watch this. Are you watching? Mm -hmm. Are you watching? Watch yes. This. I call brother Jimmy. This is, my, this is my brother right here. Watch this now. Watch this. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> now you know when you, when you when people just like basketball and sports, they had that instant slow motion replay. Let me back that up. They had to replay this about three or four times. Boom! <laughs> Boom! <laughs> you know, Satan, he's afraid. Yes. Because God said it's going to happen. He's going to crush his head. Now, I want to ask you a question. Go to Romans 16. Go to Romans 16. I want to ask you a question. When, when did Jesus crush the head of Satan? When did it happen? Sister Minnie said the cross. No, 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 no. You gave me good answer. No, no, no. It's good. She said the cross. How many agree? Did, did, she, did, 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 did the head of Satan get completely crushed at the cross? No. No, it did not. Go to Romans 69. Now, you better be careful when you say because and then that is an evangelical now. Our brothers and sisters of the church, if you said that, they'll look at you and say, wait a minute. What are you teaching? You telling me that the cross was not enough? 
You know why? They don't understand that Jesus is more than a lamb. We don't need more Jesus. Jesus is all we need. But Jesus is more than a lamb. Jesus is both a lamb and a priest. priest. As lamb, that's the beginning of his work. But we need more than the beginning of Christ. Even at the cross, the Bible says, not a bone will be broken. We needed the whole body. They had to have a whole lamb. We need not some of Christ. We need how much of it? Oh. Alpha and oh. Omega. Omega. So we need not only Christ as lamb, but Christ as a priest. priest. Now look what the Bible says in Romans 16. Go to Romans 16. Read verse 20 for me, uh, Sister Minnie. Romans 16 and verse 20. That's one of my favorite, by the way. Now, we say, oh, yes, praise God, sister. Now, question, who wrote this book? Paul. Paul. When was Paul converted? Before the cross or after the cross? <clears throat> after. after the cross. So this is after 31 AD. Now, watch what he says in Romans 16, verse 20. What did he say in verse 20, sister? Minnie? And the God of peace. Now, slow down. We'll slow down for a moment. And the God of peace, what's the next three words? Shall bruise Satan. Let's say it together. Shall, Shall bruise Satan. Satan. One more time. Shall, Shall bruise Satan. Satan. Question. Shall. Past, present, or future? future? Future. So what is the apostle putting the bruising of Satan in the past or in the future? Future. 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 But this is not before the cross. This is what? After the cross. That Satan's steel was not completely bruised even after the cross. cross. Or it would not make sense to say to the church that God is going to bruise the head of Satan under your feet if his head was already completely bruised. Yes. It would make sense. But you will find out, watch now, the bruising of Satan's head did start at the cross. It began at the cross, but it did not finish at the cross. That word in Romans 16, 20 that says to bruise comes from the word tribal in the Greek. It means to crush what? Completely. It means to bruise, to crush completely. So when he says going to bruise Satan under his feet, it means that God is going to crush completely Satan's head under the feet of his people in the last days. Now, my question is, if that did not happen at the cross completely, what day is God going to finish? Well, I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you that. What day is God? Oh, well, let me make a, What day is God going to finish the bruising of Satan? They started to cross on earth, but what day is He going to finish? On the day of atonement. On the day of atonement. Now, how can we get that from Scripture? You know, we got to go by the way of God is in the sanctuary. sanctuary. You understand this? You got to go into the sanctuary. And when you go into the sanctuary, guess what? God's going to show us in picture form the bruising of Satan's head that Genesis three fifteen talked about. We're going to see the pictorial form. Let's go back to the, the video 16 now. Go back to the video 16. Look what it says in verse 20. Is verse 20 the beginning of the Day of Atonement or the end of the Day of Atonement? The end. The end of the Day of Atonement. That's exactly right. Now let's look at this. The video 16, verse 20. Let's look at the end of the Day of Atonement. Let's read it together. All together this time. The video 16 and verse 20. What does the Bible say in verse 20? And when he had made an end, uh, oh, reconcile the holy place. place. That is the holy place. And the tabernacle of the congregation. That is the holy place. And the altar. That's the altar. that's in the holy place. After he does that in the sanctuary, he's going to bring the what? Lime Who's God to represent? Satan. Satan. Verse 21. And Aaron. Who is Aaron? Who, did he, who was he? The, the high, high priest. priest. Who do you symbolize? Jesus. Jesus. He was a type of Jesus. And Aaron shall lay how many of his hands? Both. Both his hands upon the tail of of the live goat. No. Yes. Upon the feet of the live goat. Yes. Upon the nose of the live goat. Yes. I want to make sure you have the right translation, Sister Cheryl. This is uh, uh, Cheryl. Make sure you have the right translation. Not the not the head, not the uh, tail, not the nose. He said he's going to lay both his hands on the head. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Think about it. Please make me happy. We're getting ready to close, but make me happy before we leave church. So we can say, yes, we had church today. <laughs> make me happy. <laughs> Why? Is the priest putting his hand on the head of the scapegoat? Why not the tail? Why the head? He's Satan. Because it's Now, you can't say it. Now, he's brother, brother, brother uh, Smokey said it. Anybody else? Why? Now, you can't speak now. Put a gag order on him. Why? I'll put a gag on this whole road right here first. This whole road. Gag on this. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 I got to gag the whole road. <laughs> Why did, 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 did the priest in this picture put his hand on the head of the table? 
He was crushing his head. He Amen. was crushing his head. This was the symbol. What did he say at the very beginning? Remember, God declares the end, end from, from the beginning. beginning. So what did he tell Satan at the very beginning? I, I will completely crush your, your head. head. He got a taste of it 4,000 years. Mm. But guess when? That's when it started. But guess when it's going to finish? Mm. At the end of 6,000. Watch the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the century above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death, death on the cross. By his death, he did what? Began. So what did he start at the cross? He began the work of crushing Satan's head. Mm -hmm. But he didn't do it completely. That's why Romans, after the cross, says he's going to completely crush it later on. Yeah. It says, by his death, he began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to do what? Complete. Complete. So what is he going to finish the work of crushing Satan's head? Mm -hmm. He's going to do it not on earth, that's half time. He's going to finish the work after half time where? In, in heaven. heaven. Are we together, yes or no? Oh, yes. He's going to do it on the great day of what? Atonement. When the priest comes out. Now question, how does the priest crush his head? Does he take his hand? And have because he has such strong hands, he crushes his head, head with those strong hands. No, please. It's all the same. Something. Is transferred. What's transferred to us? Sin. Sin. When Jesus, the Lamb of God, died on the cross, was it because of the nails that killed him in his hands? No. Was it the spear in his side? No. Before he even got to the cross in Gethsemane, before anyone ever touched him, he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. He would have died in Gethsemane because something was placed upon him. What was placed upon the Lamb? Sin. The wages of sin is death. What killed Jesus is your sins and what? My, My sins. So what will the priest transfer to Satan the sit go? He will put upon him what? The sins. The sins that he calls all the people to commit. Mm. And that sin is going to do what to Satan? Crush his head. Did it crush out the life of the Lamb? Yes. yes. And what is he going to do to the life of Satan? Oh. He's going to cry. He's going to put that sin. Guess how long he's going to put it on his head? Before it fully crushes him. I guess how long? A thousand years. Come on, brother. You're putting that thing together. That's the picture. Uh -huh. That sin is going to remain on his head for how long? A thousand years. At the end of a thousand years, it's going to completely crush his mm. head. Now, this is the picture. The sin must be transferred. But guess what? Where did that sin come from? Because it's the sin. That crushes the head of the serpent. Mm. Where did the sin, who the priest represents who? Jesus. Jesus. Did Jesus sin? No, no. So how is he going to transfer the sin? Where did he get the sin from? The, the sanctuary. sanctuary. He's going to cleanse the sanctuary of sin. What does the sanctuary sin? That, that, that material, does it sin? No. no. Where did that come from? The, the congregation, the people, the church. Mm. It came from what? Me. Mm -hmm. Now watch now. Look at the picture. Verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat. And let's read this together. And confess over him. him. How much? All, all the iniquities of the children of Israel. What else? All, all the iniquities of Israel. What else? All, all their sins. sins. Three times. All their iniquities. All their transgressions. All their sins. Let's say it together. All, all their iniquities. All their transgressions. All their sins. One more time. All their, their iniquities. All their transgressions. All their sins. What is iniquity? Sin. Sin. What is transgression? Sin. Sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. What is sin? Sin. sin. All their iniquities. Sin. All their transgressions. All their sins. Why three times? That's a whole other step. We can't get to it today. But it's clear that he wanted them to know how much of the sin was going to be taken away. How much? All. Oh. And this is the Bible. What day is this? The day of? Atonement. The end of the year or the end of the year? End. A type of the beginning of time or end of time? End. end. The type of the first generation or the final generation? Final. So in the final generation, the picture says that all of the sins are going to be put on the head of the yeah. scapegoat which represents Satan. Now I'm going to ask you a question. If all the sins are gone, how much sin does the congregation have? None. None. So there are less of sin. How much of sin? Sinless. So then what does that tell me? The final generation is on the day of atonement. Sinless. That means that the picture then says that on the day of atonement, on that day of atonement, there must be a final generation, the last one. And it must be what type of generation? Sinless. Is that the picture, yes or no? Yes. Now, they didn't do it in reality, they did it in type, shadow, example. But it must happen in real life. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that if God cannot bring a final generation, that is a sinless generation. He cannot crush Satan's head. Mm. 
he will have to give the kingdom to Satan, and Satan will rule it forever until he dies and the world dies, and God will be all alone by himself mm -hmm. for the ceaseless ages of eternity. Mm -hmm. That would be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. But guess what? It ain't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Excuse my, uh, they say French. <laughs> Why is it not gonna happen? Because there's power in the, in blood. the blood of the Lamb. Do you see then that the real issue is this? And this is why inspiration says, let's read this together. How many? Everyone, everyone who believes on Christ. Christ. Everyone, everyone who relies, relies on, on the keeping power of what? Our Savior. Savior. That has suffered the penalty pronounced upon the transgressor. Everyone who resists what? Temptation. Temptation. And in the midst of evil copies the pattern given him where? In, in the, the Christ life. life. Will through faith, not in themselves, but where? In, in the, the atoning, atoning sacrifice of Christ, they will become a partaker of the divine nature. Having an escape the corruption that is in the world through? Life. Now let's say this part. We should put this to memory. Let's say it together. How much? Everyone, Everyone who by faith obeys God's commandments will reach the condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression. That's redemption. Amen. That's the seven minutes message. When that message is understood, Jesus can leave the most holy place, win the war, and crush Satan's head, and even lost can become even what? Restored. Restored. And there's only one message that can do this, and Satan says, I must annihilate the message of the seven minutes church. Mm -hmm. I must steal their identity. I must take away their message. So now we have over 20 million, seven and minutes, none of us really understanding what this message is all about. Mm. Thinking that we'll be sinning until what? Jesus, Jesus comes. God must have somebody that will be brought back to perfection. Amen. Somebody that will have victory over sin. Somebody that will experience the power of Jesus and have revival reformation to the place that they will reach that sinless state. And if that does not happen, mm. Satan will win by... K-O Technicality Now That series We're going to close right here Who brings the scapegoat? The, the fit man oh, no. The Bible says in verse 21 The priest doesn't bring him. Look at the last part And all their sins putting them upon the head of the goat And shall send them away by the hand of a what? Fit man the Who brings the scapegoat? Fit, fit man. man Now I'm going to ask you a question have you ever thought about what the fit man means? Have you ever thought about what the fit man means? You know, normally the person says, he's exercising. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me show you what the fit man means. We'll come up. This is, this is a type of the silly generation. We're going to find out what the fit man means in just a moment. Let's read this together. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, break on verse 656. For the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that wicked to the sword. For how long? Six thousand years. Okay, now I want you to read this this time. For six thousand years, the great controversy has yeah. been in progress from that war now. The Son of God and His heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. What is the next word? Now. All have what? Made Amen. their decisions. When? At the end of what? Six thousand years. The wicked have fully united with Satan in his warfare against God. When? At the end of what? Six thousand years. And then it says, the time has come. come. When? At the end of what? 6,000 6, years. For God to vindicate the authority of his downtown law. Now I'm going to ask you a question. At the end of 6,000 years, it says the time has what? Come. Now please, as we conclude, think about it before you answer. Let's be happy. Thy will, God, is in the sanctuary. So at the end of 6,000 years, the time has come for what? And it says, at the end of 6,000 years, all made their decisions. The wicked are fully united with Satan, the righteous with God. Then it says, at the end of that 6,000 years, the time has come. Time for what? The time. Tell me what you mean by that. Jesus goes into the most holy place. Time for him to go into the most holy place? Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. At the end of 6,000 years, it's time for him to what? Come out. Come out. So guess what? At the end of six hour years, he's coming. Ready? Or no. or no. And if we're not ready, guess what happens to Christ? He loses by what? Taking the count. And so the question is, we don't have to go to sin right now. If Satan, if the high priest were to come out right now, 
Guess what would happen? Oh, the whole universe would be lost. We need to get it together. So the question is, if he's coming at 6,000, you know the question should be then? How does 6,000? How close? Because it says at the end of 6,000, now what? The event. The event takes place. Foreshadowed in the last solemn service of the day of atonement. And read it, read it, read it, read it. Quotes of Vicar 6 21. We just read it. In like manner, when the work of the atonement of the heavenly sanctuary has been completed, then in the presence of God and heavenly angels and the host of the redeemed, the sins of God's people will be placed upon who? Satan. He will be declared guilty of all the evil which he has caused him to commit. And as the scapegoat was sent away into a land, what? Not inhabited. So Satan will be banished to the desolate. Earth. And uninhabited and dreary what? Wilderness. The revelator foretells the banishment of Satan and the condition of chaos and desolation to which the earth is to be reduced, and he declares that this condition will exist for how long? A thousand years. How long will sin be on his head in the wilderness? A thousand years. Is that in the Bible? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 20. You read it. It says that the angel comes down and with a chain binds that serpent for a thousand years. Right here in this wilderness. Now, my brothers and sisters, that tells me that that links the end of the day of atonement with the beginning of the thousand year period, which means that the day of atonement has to end at 6,000 so that the 1,000 years in heaven can end on time and 6,000 plus 1,000 equals what? 7,000. That means that Jesus is going to come out of the sanctuary to put the sins on Satan at the end of 6,000 years. And if he does not have our sins, guess what? Satan does not lose. Satan will what? Win. 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 He's coming out on time. In like manner, the times which relate to the second event, not might, but what? Must. They must be fulfilled at the time. time. And what is the time? 6,000 6, years. years. This is that word now. 6,000 years. Fit man. In the Hebrew, it comes from a word, fit man comes from a word that means what? 18. 18. What does it mean? Time. time. So what is it? Fit man. A fit man is a timely man or a man who comes where? On time. What does that tell me? When the scapegoat comes, how's the scapegoat coming? By a fit man. What does that mean? Time. It's going to come by a man who always comes on, on time. time. And what time is that fit man going to bring the scapegoat? At the end of what? 6,000 Six years. And the only question that should be in our mind, if that's true and it's going to happen on time, the question shall be, well, I'll close up. Our time is running out. I'm going to tell you something. We're going to prove when we come back. And I know next week, Pastor will be coming. But whatever, after that, I don't know what time after that. The next time we come, we're going to come back. You know the question should be, if this is going to happen, we need to know. In 2020, how close? Then we need to know what we need to be doing to get victory over what? Sin. Is that true? Yes. yes. Because what if we find out that we have but a few short months to a few short years until that 6,000 years is almost over? What's the most important thing we can be doing right now? Make sure that Jesus wins the war. Mm -hmm. And the only way for him to lose, he's, he's been successful. The only way for him to lose with us is if Satan can keep us in sin. But in John 1.29, let's all read it as we conclude. You know what Jesus says? Behold, Behold the, the Lamb of God. God. Which take taken it away, away the sin of the world. In order to become sinless, we need somebody. Yes. You know what we need? Jesus. Jesus. We need Jesus. But I'm just talking about it. We're going to find out that there's some physical things that Jesus gave us. Mm -hmm. It's a spiritual thing. On the day of atonement, they didn't just become sinners in type. You know that in the type, there was particular duties that they were supposed to do in order for the priest to do his work in them. Mm -hmm. We have to begin studying the Bible and find out, Lord, how close are we? What does this mean? And then how can I work with Jesus so that Jesus can bring me so close to Jesus mm -hmm. that I would rather die than sin? Amen. Do you want this experience? Yes. yes. Is this serious, yes or no? Very. Yes. How much is that state? Everything. 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 How many people in this world know this? Uh, not many. You know, there's no church knows it. There's only one church that has the opportunity. You know, that's Seven Minutes Church. But guess what? The majority even of seminary in this church don't know this. You know why? Because Satan has been successful in taking us out of the sanctuary, causing us to lose our identity. identity. What is the time right now? To get it back. So that we can get Jesus, finish the work, and can come crush Satan's head and take us home. I want to be ready with you. Say. Amen. And that's your desire, which reverently deal with me as we finish. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we have felt your presence. We've heard your words, and Lord, we can begin to see a little more clearly how much is at stake. Mm. Not just the salvation of one little person. The whole universe is at stake. Mm. The very existence of humanity, the very honor of thee, O God, is at stake. And you have pledged yourself to win this great universe. Mm. With men, this is impossible. So much so that Satan flatters himself. Look at us. We love television too much to give it up. Mm. We love the things that we eat and the clothes that we wear. We love the places of amusement. We love the wrong thoughts and selfishness too much to give it up. And Satan flatters himself. They will never give up everything for Jesus. Mm. But Lord, I want to shame the devil. Yes. By your grace, I want to show him that with your power, that we will be willing to give up everything. We will rather even to give up life itself if we can win the character of God and vindicate it before the universe. Mm. Lord, help us to get to know you so closely that we will rather die than sin. Mm. Please, dear God, help us this week to turn our eyes upon Jesus that by beholding we may become changed. Yes. I pause the prayer that someone here today says, Lord, I see the issue more clearly now. I want to study this and get right with thee, and I want to not only be saved, but to be used to help others in this final generation so that you can win this 6,000-year war. Just raise your hand wherever you are. And by raising your hand, you're saying, Dear God, I want your help. Father, you see the hands. I'm lifting my hand. Be with us, Lord. Save us. And help us to study this day of atonement so that we can understand how we can work with you to finish the work by getting victory over sin by the power of the indwelling Christ. We thank you, Lord. Please keep us and bring us back, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.